It's 3 a.m. and the facility is quiet. Office workers and administrators roam the halls. Security officers stand at their posts, clad in advanced tactical armor and carrying standard-issue M4 carbines. Three Foundation employees sit at flickering monitors watching a live feed of footage from the containment cell of the infamous SCP-106, or as it's referred to by all staff, the old man. No Foundation personnel are permitted to travel within 60 feet of the cell for security reasons, and nobody is permitted to physically interact with the anomaly without the approval of two-thirds of O5 Command. The observer's eyes itch and sting from hours of unending blue light exposure, but they can't look away. The old man is crafty. He might have the insatiable bloodlust of a hungry great white shark, but he's not mindless. He's a calculating predator, more sadistic than the worst human serial killer, and he's always searching for the next opportunity. According to the Foundation records, he's been active since at least World War II, and it's estimated that he has hundreds if not thousands of victims to his name, and many of those made simple but extremely foolish mistakes of underestimating him. After all, it only takes a few seconds of inattentiveness and the briefest moment of distraction to give him the window he needs. To do what, you ask? Oh, don't worry, you'll find out, just like they did. <laughs> the old man has his nickname for a reason. Most of the time, he really does look exactly like that, an old man, or more specifically an old man's decaying corpse, his body covered in rotten, dark, grayish-black flesh that looks like putrid meat. Though the creature has been observed being able to change shape, the rot seems to run too deep for the old man to ever hide it. Foundation employees that have observed SCP-106 for extended periods of time have reported seeing it assume the form of grinning, decayed children and women whose rotted flesh barely hangs on their creaking bones. Just seeing the images through a video feed is enough to cause a lifetime of insomnia and other sleeping issues. Still, they have a job to do and the cameras remain fixed on the old man. He's been completely motionless for three months, just sitting there like a Buddhist monk in deep meditation. A novice might see this period of inactivity as a cause for celebration, but those with experience know that this is merely the calm before the storm. SCP-106 can remain in a dormant state for months at a time. Described by the Foundation scientists as a lulling state, it's believed that the old man is simply waiting for its captors to get soft, make a mistake, or simply have a momentary lapse in concentration, which is all it needs to make its move. It had happened so many times before, and it was about to happen again. One of the observers must have felt an overwhelming wave of anxiety as he saw the creature ever so slightly twitch. Just a tiny quiver in the shoulder muscles, but that was enough to tell the observer that their day had just taken a terrifying turn. He grabbed the emergency phone fixed to his desk and practically screamed into the receiver that 106 is moving, that they need a tactical team stat, but it was already too late. He and the other two observers stared into the monitors with their mouths agape as a gooey, rust-like substance began to pool around the creature on the floor of its cell. Slowly, the creature craned its withered neck around. Its face was fixed into a broad, yellow-toothed, lipless grin. Its eyes had the kind of dull, flat malice of an underwater predator. It looked directly into the camera, directly at them, and smiled. The observers knew this was bad, really, really bad. With what they could have sworn was a little nod, the old man began sinking into the rusty puddle it made on the ground beneath it, until it had disappeared entirely. SCP-106 is capable of phasing through any solid surface with ease, making it one of the hardest entities to reliably contain and earning it a spot on the dreaded Keter class, reserved for the anomalies that are complete nightmares to keep locked up. Through the years of costly research and deadly trial and error, the Foundation would later devise ways of at least slowing the creature down. It's shown to have an aversion to lead, highly complex or random physical structures, and intense bright light. None of these cause harm to the creature, as far as we know, literally nothing can, but they'll at least buy you some precious extra seconds with which to at least try and escape. Seconds the three observers didn't have. One of them grabbed an emergency line again and barked into it that they had lost visual on the anomaly. Just then the observers heard a faint crackling sound behind them and the hissing of a chemical burn. They turned in horror to see a huge rusty burn mark expanding across the wall, right next to the door, which was their only escape route. They backed as far away from the door as they could as a rotten hand began reaching out of the mass of corrosive black sludge, followed by the grinning face of SCP-106, ready to have some fun. Meanwhile, two heavily armed security officers, Agents Goodwin and Resnick, came charging down the corridor toward the observation rooms. It became a bleak slogan during SCP-106 escape attempts that all you need to do is follow the screams, and that motto was proven true that night, because awful things were happening to the observation personnel. They were certainly screaming about it. Of course, even with the top-of-the-line firearms, there was little they could do to harm the rampaging old man. 
He seemed immune to all forms of physical damage. All they could hope to do was keep the thing distracted until the scientists and containment specialists finished the preparations to lure him back into his containment cell. Goodwin surged forward while Resnick covered his six. Vigilance was key, as unlike a standard human combatant, SCP-106 could attack from literally any angle including above or below. Physical obstacles were irrelevant to him and no cover was safe. The hardened security officers could see the burn mark on the wall of the observation room as they approached. SCP-106 was perpetually coated in a thick black mucus with powerful corrosive properties that left any surfaces it touched permanently marred. Foundation scientists speculated that this mucus served as a kind of pre-digestive substance that tenderizes meat and bone alike, but to what purpose this serves is a mystery as the old man has never been observed eating. It's postulated that the only purpose is causing additional pain. Goodwin and Resnick knew to treat this hissing sludge as a potential threat, as the corrosive properties would remain active for as much as six hours before finally fizzling out. The two officers shared a quiet nod before Goodwin breached the observation room door with a hard kick. The two of them surged inside, guns at the ready. In their time working at the Foundation, they'd seen some truly horrific sights. From the mutilation of D-Class personnel, typically death row prison inmates brought in for use as SCP guinea pigs, to the violence and mayhem of a containment breach. But there was nothing in their past that would ever make the horrifying sight they saw in the observation room that night feel normal. All three observers were dead. Almost nothing remained of two of them, and the third, while still intact, no longer looked human. He looked like he'd somehow been dead a hundred years in the brief period that the old man had been free. His skin was gray and completely dried out, and his mouth was locked into a perpetual scream. It was a massacre, but there was no sign of the old man. Goodwin grabbed his radio and whispered, This is Goodwin in Observation Room 6, requesting immediate backup. We have no idea where this thing is. But his sentence was cut off by a sudden scream from Agent Resnick. SCP Foundation security officers are as tough as nails, the best of the best, you might say, recruited from the top military organizations in the world. So hearing one of them scream in fright is a rare, if not impossible, occurrence. But even they were forced to yell out in fear when they looked up to see the old man standing on the ceiling, grinning down at them. Resnick raised his M4 and shot a three-round burst at center mass. SCP-106 didn't care. Even under sustained gunfire from the two security officers, it didn't flinch. The old man simply reached down and snatched Agent Resnick from the ground like it was picking an apple from a tree. The old man held Resnick in one hand and pounded its other rotten fist into the agent's body, breaking all of his bones. Resnick screamed for his partner to help him, but there was no time. Before Goodwin could do anything, SCP-106 began receding back into another slimy burn mark on the wall, only this time he was taking his screaming victim with him. Agent Resnick gave one more horrified scream before he was pulled backward into the inky darkness, leaving the room silent except for the burning hiss of the corrosive goo left behind. You might think this would be the end of it, but no. For poor Agent Resnick, the worst was yet to come. He was being dragged into what the SCP Foundation scientists refer to as the old man's pocket dimension, a miniature layer of reality within our own where the malicious SCP is essentially a cruel, all-powerful god. According to witness reports extracted from victims who were taken to this little nightmare realm, the dimension resembles a series of twisting, endless corridors where the old man stalks and tortures his captured victims to the breaking point, manipulating space and time to his own sadistic ends. On rare occasions, the SCP will even release its victims just for the joy of hunting, capturing, and torturing them all over again. While Agent Resnick was learning the true meaning of terror, containment specialists were mobilizing in its cell, preparing the one known tried and true method of luring the old man back, tempting it with the prospect of causing even more suffering. In order to do this, Foundation personnel take one of the aforementioned Class D personnel and begin inducing extreme pain by breaking a major bone or slicing a tendon every 20 minutes. The victim's agonizing screams are then played over the facility's intercom, acting as bait for the pain-loving old man. The screams echo through the facility's otherwise silent halls as the mutilated corpse of Agent Resnick falls from a new scorch mark on the ceiling. The old man can hear the sounds of suffering ringing out through the air around him, and he can barely contain his excitement over the prospect of a new plaything. The snapped femurs, the torn Achilles tendons, it was all too good to miss. Having had its twisted fun with the security officers and observers, SCP-106 wandered back to its containment cell, where a new screaming victim awaited. 
The other security officers, containment specialists, and scientists evacuated the area, leaving the old man alone with his prey. While the unfortunate Class D was left to his fate, the rest of the staff commenced cleanup procedures, which mainly involved wiping the brown and black mucus from the walls. It would probably be at least another month before anything like this happened again, and new personnel would be transferred over to the facility to replace the fallen. All in all, just another night at the SCP Foundation. There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the Foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long abandoned cemetery. The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. On further investigation, the Foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals, or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown, likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20, 2016 until… At that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny, to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet, and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to Mission Command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the mirror dimension, where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine, but they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. 
die. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies, nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members, with the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer. The team split into two groups of eight, and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the Mirror Dimension Site-81, while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland, and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once in the Mirror Universe. Once inside Site-81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard, and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the mirror dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 AM. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. 
When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared. Death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers. I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar to the Foundation Command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world, and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all. An SCP Foundation researcher sits at a table inside of a standard containment cell. These are often dangerous places to be, especially when the SCP you're supposed to be studying is one that you can't see. The researcher is taking notes, unsure of exactly what is going to happen next. He can hear the sounds of knives scraping behind, of flesh sizzling and searing from high heat. He braces himself as a burst of heat hits the back of his head, as if a fireball has erupted. An object floats through the air and settles in front of him on the table. It's a plate of food, and it looks delicious. It may surprise you to learn that there is no rule that the SCP Foundation must deal exclusively with violent and vicious creatures. Not every SCP held in containment shares the same malevolence and contempt for humanity as SCP-682, or the world-ending threat posed by the likes of SCP-2317. Some, perhaps not many, but some are benign and might even seem outwardly friendly, but you'd still be taking a huge risk to assume that anything contained by the SCP Foundation is completely harmless. Such is the case with SCP-5031. As per the Foundation's containment procedures, this quasi-humanoid, meaning it appears to have some vaguely human features, is held in an airtight cell that is regularly checked by Foundation personnel on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-5031 has no need for regular nutrition or regular interactions from staff. The trick with SCP-5031 is not being eaten by it, since though it doesn't need food, it does still hunt and consume anything it encounters, human or otherwise. Avoiding being eaten is hard enough with creatures that can actually be seen, but like so many other creatures the Foundation keeps contained, SCP-5031 has developed an almost perfect defense mechanism, which is when observed, it will literally cease to exist. Some might choose to refer to this as a quantum lock, however it is worth noting that traces left by SCP-5031 still remain observable when the creature has temporarily disappeared. For example, trails of blood and scratch marks left behind by SCP-5031 still exist when the SCP itself does not. Naturally, this makes both avoiding the creature and capturing it using cameras difficult. However, when SCP-5031's existence ceases, it still casts a shadow. From this, researchers have been able to determine several of the creature's physical traits, 
Based on its silhouette, it has been deduced that SCP-5031 levitates about half a meter above ground level, sports an abnormally small necklace head atop an elongated torso, approximately 1.9 meters long, with three sets of spindly lower arms that branch outwards. Using these arms and its loosely hanging body, SCP-5031 will lower itself to hunt any human or animal that draws near to it, and uses the blade-like tail to cut up food. Perhaps the most interesting facet of SCP-5031 beyond its defensive capabilities and apparent physical attributes are the series of nine tests conducted by senior researcher Stanley Huxtable. Appalled by the conditions that the creature was being kept in, Huxtable took over the role of HCL supervisor for SCP-5031. Having grown increasingly frustrated and empathetic towards the creature, listening to its screams from inside its iron containment unit, Huxtable devised a series of tests to introduce SCP-5031 to various different stimuli as a way to better understand the creature, and hopefully keep it contained in a way that didn't seem to cause so much suffering. It's worth remembering that the SCP Foundation makes its mission to be cold, not cruel, in performing their duties to protect normality and many of the researchers and staff are just as capable of having empathy for creatures as you might for a stray animal at a shelter. The first of Huxtable's tests involved installing speakers in SCP-5031 cell, through which a variety of different ambient and popular pieces of music were played to see if they had any effect on reducing the creature's stress. By judging SCP-5031 stress levels based on how much it screamed when compared to normal, Huxtable was able to determine how to best use music to calm the creature. SCP-5031 seemed to convey higher levels of stress when listening to Morning Forest, Deep Grotto, and Seaside Paradise ambience, as well as the best of late 60s British rock band Jethro Tull. However, the best of Mozart, Enya, Kiss, and Ben Folds produced dramatically different results, decreasing SCP-5031's apparent stress. Following this test, senior researcher Huxtable compiled a playlist featuring SCP-5031's favorite music. Over time, the stress-reducing effects of music on SCP-5031 seemed to decrease, but keeping the playlist on shuffle seemed to keep the creature consistently calmer than it had been previously. The next test involved introducing inanimate objects into SCP-5031's enclosure to monitor its reactions and how its stress levels were affected. When a softball was thrown into the enclosure, SCP-5031 immediately sliced the ball in two with its tail in one swift motion. A similar result occurred when researchers threw the creature a basketball, which was quickly punctured and sliced open by SCP-5031's tail. Its stress levels first seemed to diminish when the creature was offered a bowling ball, which it rolled around the enclosure and then later knocked it against a second bowling ball. However, when one of the balls chipped, rendering it unable to roll properly, SCP-5031 stress increased dramatically until a replacement was offered. Researcher Huxtable noted that SCP-5031 seemed to possess a similar level of motor skills to an average human toddler, with similarly explosive emotional reactions to match. <laughs> Next, when given the choice between two food sources at opposite ends of its enclosure, SCP-5031 seemed to gravitate towards higher quality food, most notably favored cooked rotisserie chickens over animal carcasses. It even chose this option over a live chicken, using its tail to cut its food into more manageable bite-sized portions, rather than ripping its meat with its hands or teeth like many of its fellow SCPs. Researcher Huxtable recorded these findings and highlighted that, even though SCP-5031 didn't need to eat in order to survive, providing the creature with food of a better quality marginally reduced its stress. Senior researcher Huxtable next attempted to test SCP-5031's coexistence with other living subjects, each time making sure that the creature had been adequately fed to avoid any unseemly incidents. First, a live chicken was introduced. SCP-5031 rolled its bowling ball at high speed towards the chicken, increasing both its and the chicken's stress levels, and inadvertently killing the chicken in the process. When a second chicken was introduced, SCP-5031 gently rolled a basketball towards it, but ceased any further engagement after the chicken squawked from being hit by the ball. Next to be introduced into the enclosure was a blindfolded D-Class staff member, who was instructed to sit down and roll the basketball towards SCP-5031. After doing so for several minutes, the creature began to approach the D-Class subject, 
who was instructed to remove their blindfold to cease the creature's existence and prevent any potentially deadly incidents. Finally, researcher Huxtable had another Class D engage in a game of catch with SCP-5031 while facing away from the creature. This test proceeded successfully, and senior researcher Huxtable remarked how SCP-5031's motor skills were improving, albeit gradually and with some gentle encouragement. Through Huxtable's tests, the creature was learning. The next test, focused on teaching SCP-5031 linguistic symbols, utilized LCD displays and buttons connected to a food dispenser. One display showed an image of a rock, and the other an image of a rotisserie chicken. After some brief probing, SCP-5031 was quickly able to understand that pressing the button under the correct display would dispense a rotisserie chicken for it to eat. The creature was later able to adapt when, the following day, the screen displays and materials dispensed were swapped, and then later set to swap at random intervals. When additional rock dispensing stations were introduced, this time displaying the word rock as opposed to an image, SCP-5031 was able to determine which station dispensed chicken through a process of elimination. Whenever the functions and displays were swapped, SCP-5031 would find whichever displayed the word chicken to receive its food. The final phase of this test presented SCP-5031 with a single station, displaying the word chicken, but with a button that would remain inactive unless the creature spelled out the same word with a collection of lettered blocks it was provided with. After some initial confusion and frustrations as to why the button would not dispense food when pressed, SCP-5031 was able to assemble the word correctly, not only activating the button and dispensing food, but proving to researcher Huxtable that the creature was capable of learning language. Huxtable continued to test the creature, encouraging it to spell words using lettered blocks as a method of communicating. By increasing SCP-5031's vocabulary and the amount of human interaction it received, senior researcher Huxtable observed that SCP-5031 was gradually learning to sing, albeit non-verbally, as well as to juggle with its six hands and was even communicating its food preferences and dish pairings. Later, another Class D, D-52125, was introduced to SCP-5031's enclosure to aid in further testing. Through D-52125's instructions, the creature quickly learned to draw using crayons and created artworks depicting itself. Its newfound friend D-52125, researcher Huxtable, a cat, and a rotisserie chicken. SCP-5031's new creative side didn't stop there, though, as the creature quickly learned to play chopsticks in only two days once a piano was introduced into the enclosure. SCP-5031 even managed to start creating its own original, admittedly crude, compositions. Next, a spice rack was placed inside the creature's cell, and D-52125 demonstrated how to season meat. This proved to be SCP-5031's new favorite hobby, as it spent the next three days experimenting with different combinations of foods and spices, using its letter blocks to request more, more, more garlic powder. Interestingly, the creature only created artwork or music when D-52125 was present, but seemed to thoroughly enjoy its experimentation with food when left alone. Following this development, senior researcher Huxtable devised a new test for SCP-5031 providing the creature with cooking utensils and using D-52125 to demonstrate. 5031 was shown how to prepare a variety of different dishes, from hamburgers and tacos to Mongolian beef, steak, clam chowder, and profiteroles. In addition to a small peanut allergy, this eighth test revealed SCP-5031 to be a phenomenal chef, possessing culinary skills far beyond the average person. The creature quickly and enthusiastically embraced its newfound talents, concocting its very own brand new recipes, with D-52125 even volunteering to be the first to taste test 5031's dishes. It was shortly after this test that SCP-5031 spoke its very first word. And it should come as no surprise that the word was salt. Naturally, senior researcher Huxtable was very proud of the progress the creature had made with its development. The final test almost seemed to be what the creature was born for. Over the course of two months, SCP-5031 was tasked with creating a full three-course meal, which would then be served to Foundation staff for Thanksgiving. SCP-5031 not only rose to the task, but exceeded all of researcher Huxtable's expectations, creating a meal that even Gordon Ramsay would be hard-pressed to find fault with. 
the creature created a first course consisting of sweet potato miso soup seasoned with turmeric. Next came a beautiful duck confit, glazed luxuriously with apple cider, and topped generously with sweet cranberry compote, paired with a side of butternut squash gnocchi and served on a bed of kale seasoned with truffle salt. The grand finale of the exquisite meal was a spiced cassava pie for dessert, complemented with the finest French vanilla ice cream and a maple hazelnut syrup. And SCP-5031 didn't stop there. The creature also debuted one of its original musical compositions to complement the decadent meal it had created. As the staff enjoyed the food, SCP-5031 performed live from its enclosure the deeply moving Piano Concerto for Six Hands to an overwhelmingly positive response from not only senior researcher Huxtable, but the entire Foundation staff. As a fitting end to the creature's tale, Huxtable reported that, during the Thanksgiving banquet it had created, SCP-5031's stress levels reduced entirely. New, kinder containment measures that would keep 5031 safer but also far more contented were submitted for approval. Perhaps some of you may find it refreshing to learn that SCP-5031 isn't simply just another malicious, malevolent monster that the Foundation has to keep under lock and key for the safety of the world. Instead, SCP-5031 is a gentle, if a little frightening at first, creature that just requires careful and considered guidance instead of a cold iron cage and around-the-clock armed guards. Through testing, senior researcher Stanley Huxtable and his fellow Foundation staff were not only able to help the creature develop, but also found what makes it tick, and not just for the purposes of containing it. Instead, it is hoped that SCP-5031's creativity and flair for culinary and musical masterpieces can continue to thrive and grow under the proud watch of researcher Huxtable. <sighs> here we go again. It's time to return to the acid-filled containment chamber of SCP-682, more commonly known as the hard-to-destroy reptile. We've spoken about him and the ways the SCP Foundation has attempted to destroy him in a previous video. But as we said back then, we really only scratched the surface of the huge number of insane ways the Foundation has tried to wipe this cranky lizard off the face of the Earth. Today, we're filling in some of the cracks and taking a look at the secret test logs detailing the Foundation's unsuccessful quest to finally destroy SCP-682. Some of these may surprise you, and if you're a real SCP expert, you may just recognize some familiar faces we meet along the way. Esteemed Foundation researcher Dr. Alto Clef, famed for his somewhat unconventional personality, entered the test chamber to see if he could intimidate the beast to death. This resulted in a long staring contest between Dr. Clef and 682. Towards the end of the competition, Dr. Clef began to lose his nerve. He tried to leave the room, only to find that the door was locked, causing him to swear loudly. Dr. Clef, who always tries to find the most direct solution to his problems, blew up the door with plastic explosives and ran off. The result? test failed. Next came SCP-662, a silver handbell that summons the supernaturally helpful butler, Mr. Deeds. When Mr. Deeds was summoned, Foundation researchers asked him if he could kill SCP-682. Deeds politely explained that he wouldn't be capable of killing 682. It's just too strong. When he asked if he could at least incapacitate 682, he replied that the best way to do this would be to poison himself and allow 682 to eat his body. But this, he reminded, would only be a temporary problem for the lizard. Another test failed. The Foundation brought in SCP-689, a terrifying soapstone statue of a sitting skeleton that can kill you if you see it and then stop paying attention to it. 682 first observed the statue, and then the Foundation turned off the lights. When they turned them back on, SCP-682 appeared to be dead in a puddle of gray and black liquid. D-Class personnel were sent in to confirm that 682 was actually dead, but it instead got up and killed them. Researchers theorized that 682's definition of life is not quite the same as ours, rendering 689's death-related powers ineffective. Test failed yet again. SCP-807 was next up to bat. 
This is an anomalous salmon-colored ceramic dinner plate with the words Last Chance Diner printed on the edges in white. Any food placed on it becomes irresistible by any definition, but when the food is consumed it causes immediate cardiac arrest due to the sudden clogging of arteries with fat. Researchers made a meal known as the 682 Special. 10 kilograms of rotten mead and sharpened bone splinters, 10 liters of rancid mayonnaise, 1 liter of potassium cyanide, and 1 kilogram of morphine hydrochloride, combined into a solid mass and transmuted by 807. When 682 consumed this disgusting meal, it appeared to collapse. However, when D-Class personnel were sent in again to see whether 682 was truly out for the count, multiple holes opened up in its body. These holes fired out high-pressure jets of blood, killing the nearby D-Classes and destroying the containment cell. 682 was fine afterwards. Another test failed. To kill 682, it seemed that the Foundation really needed to have God on their side. So they tried to recruit SCP-343, also known as God, to help them destroy the beast. However, when he entered the containment chamber, he somehow couldn't even see the beast. When researchers asked him whether he could kill 682, God replied, He's not one of mine. Deal with him yourself. Test failed before it even began. Next, the Foundation recruited SCP-524, a small white rabbit that can eat literally anything, including itself without being harmed. The rabbit was released into SCP-682's chamber, at which point it approached 682 and began to eat one of its legs. 682 roared in pain and scuttled up the wall, out of 524's reach, where it remained for a number of hours. At this point, SCP-524 seemed to become bored and began eating its way out of containment through a nearby wall. Test failed. Maybe the luck of the Irish was what the Foundation needed to finally put this monster to rest. They recruited SCP-1933, a fat man dressed as Santa Claus whose bodily fluids consist entirely of the alcoholic beverage known as Irish cream. If enough of this man's self-produced Irish cream is fed to something, they'll find that all of their bodily fluids have become Irish cream too, killing them. The Foundation fed large quantities of this Irish cream to SCP-682 and it actually had an effect, causing 682 to appear intoxicated, which was a promising sign. However, it soon vomited out a massive quantity of SCP-1933 bodily fluids turning the walls of its cell into Irish cream and allowing it to escape and wreak havoc. Test failed. Big time. The Foundation recruited the help of SCP-2337, an intelligent corn crake known as Dr. Spanko, with a voice so loud it can quite literally talk its victims to death if it speaks to them for an extended period of time. It was sent into SCP-682's chamber to attempt to destroy the beast, but 682 just told it to leave, and the talkative bird obliged by blowing away one of the chamber walls with a yell, allowing SCP-682 to breach containment again. Terrible job, Dr. Spanko. Test failed. The Foundation researchers were starting to get a little frustrated with their lack of progress, which you can no doubt sympathize with, and they even pitched the possibility of sending SCP-682 into an alternate dimension where perhaps it would enter into a stalemate against its alternate self. But this pitch was shot down by the O5 Council on the grounds that it was way, 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 way too risky. Back to the drawing board, by which we mean they literally transformed 682's skin into a kind of drawing board. SCP-2521 is an anomaly that manifests any time information about it is recorded and immediately grabs the source of the information, wrapping it in its tendrils and taking it away with it. The Foundation sought to take advantage of this by using a laser cutter to cut this anomalous information into SCP-682's side. However, this didn't have the results they were hoping for. SCP-2521 did turn up to take the information, but it only took the skin on which the information was carved. 682 survived and quickly grew back its skin. Test failed. Again. Researchers suggested tracking down SCP-169, an obscenely massive underwater creature known as the Leviathan, and feeding 682 to the beast. However, this idea was also immediately shot down by the O5 Council. If 682 did what it did best, which was surviving attacks and adding them to its own arsenal, then it might grow to the size of SCP-169. 
which would likely trigger an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. It simply was not worth the risk. Test failed before it even started. The Foundation released two specimens of SCP-939 into 682's test chamber. These voice-imitating, amnesia-inducing monsters have caused huge damage to human targets, so it was hoped that they may be able to do something to 682. But this hope turned out to be misplaced. Both specimens seemed extremely distressed by 682's presence, and refused to engage at all. 682 did not share the same apprehension about attacking. It charged in and brutally killed both before devouring their corpses. Test failed. In a very well-documented case, the adorable SCP-999 was introduced into 682's test chamber. The unassailable good vibes provided by 999 as well as an intense tickle fight did actually lead to the temporary incapacitation of SCP-682. However, the otherwise wholesome incident ended in tragedy when 682 adapted to the good vibes and was able to release a kind of violent laughter wave. This incapacitated much of the staff and allowed 682 to breach containment and go on another killing spree before being recontained. Test, once again, failed. The next test involved SCP-294, an anomalous coffee machine that can produce any liquid typed into its keypad. Foundation researchers requested SCP-682 killer from the machine and were astounded by the results. During tests on the liquid with SCP-682 tissue samples, the liquid was surprisingly effective and caused the 682 tissue to decay and crumble. Tests on the living creature were similarly promising. The acid in 682's tank was temporarily lowered, and one liter of SCP-682 killer was poured onto the reptile's head, causing that portion of its flesh to immediately decay. When the acid was returned, the same portion that had the liquid poured on it dissolved instantly. Test, well, not quite successful, but promising. And requiring further research, Foundation scientists believe that if they could one day get a large enough quantity of this liquid, they might have a viable option. But until then, the tests march on. For another experiment, they introduced SCP-055 into the containment chamber of SCP-682. SCP-055, also known as the self-keeping secret, is a mysterious anomaly that can only be described by what it isn't. For example, we know that SCP-055 is not round, but that was pretty much it. Now, however, we know something else about SCP-055, that it can't kill SCP-682. Test failed, but at least we know twice as much about SCP-055 as we did before. Next came SCP-082 better known as Fernand the Cannibal. Fernand was first presented a piece of flesh from 682, but rather than eating it, he inspected it and began to express joy that his friend still lived. When introduced into 682's testing chamber, Fernand attempted to subdue the lizard and use it as his steed. 682 expressed an intense hatred for both Fernand and the idea of being ridden like a pony, and the two of them engaged in combat. Mobile task forces were eventually brought in to subdue both subjects. In a debrief interview, both hinted that they shared history prior to containment, but 682 was reluctant to talk about it further. Test entertaining, but still a failure. Researchers were becoming extremely frustrated with SCP-682's unwillingness to die, so they called in an SCP who responded to reason much better. SCP-049, The Plague Doctor. This sinister surgeon can kill with a touch, and the Foundation hoped that his abilities would extend to 682. However, the result was a dud. The Plague Doctor did touch 682, but it experienced no adverse effects and eventually swiped at the Doctor. Upon leaving, 049 reported feeling emotionally disturbed by his encounter with SCP-682. Yep, you guessed it. Test failed. If it gives you any indication of just how desperate the researchers were at this point, Dr. Graham pondered whether introducing 682 to a human with just as pessimistic and misanthropic feelings as itself would somehow pacify it. They sent in a particularly nasty D-Class, and the two spoke. Fascinatingly, 682 didn't attempt to harm this D-Class. They just shared their profane and bleak sentiments about the human race with one another. However, some of 682's opinions were a little too spicy for this D-Class, 
After listening to the reptile speak for 20 minutes, the D-Class fell into a catatonic state from the sheer depression of it all. He died not long after. One researcher suggested perhaps the worst idea of all, letting SCP-682 out into the wild. Not even really to terminate it, just to see what it does. The scientists figured there would be some merit in analyzing the creature's behavior. This idea was submitted anonymously, of course. It seems even the most sadistic of researchers know better than to put their name on an idea like that. As you can probably guess, this request was shot down by the O5 Council. The note attached to the request by one of its members summed it up best. I'll tell you what it will do. It'll go out for a nice stroll, murder a few innocent people, go fishing, slaughter a few more innocent people, start up a tech company, eat a few more innocent people, go on a vacation to Florida, dismember a few more innocent people. I swear, when I find out who wrote this, you can personally enter 682's containment chamber to analyze him yourself. This has been far from an exhaustive account of all the different ways the SCP Foundation has tried to terminate SCP-682. But it shouldn't be surprising that all of their ideas have either been failures or were too risky to even try. Sadly for the SCP Foundation and the human race, it's likely we'll be dealing with SCP-682 for a long time to come. But do you have an idea for how you think 682 could finally be killed? Something that even the Foundation hasn't thought of to try? Let us know in the comments. Over 50 men and women, clad in red robes, kneel before an unholy altar. They chant and mutter indecipherable words, words of cruelty and madness, of obsession and sacrilege. Not long ago, these were regular people. Computer technicians, teachers, plumbers, construction workers, accountants. This was before they fell under the ungodly influence of a new ruler. The center of this makeshift place of worship was once a normal school gymnasium, but it's now the home of a huge statue. A humanoid being, wreathed in tentacles. Its head is more like a squid or cuttlefish than anything resembling an actual human face. While he's known to the cultists as the Tentacled God, the beast they worship is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2662 and he sits in the belly of one of their expansive containment facilities, locked away from the world. But not for long, if his devoted followers have anything to say about it. This is their god, all-powerful and unchanging, and when it comes to springing him from containment, no tactic is too vile or underhanded to get the job done. Their mortal leader and high priest, a man in a purple robe calling himself Brother Marsh, walks among their crouched forms. He whispers instructions for the great day of liberation that's soon to come, providing everyone plays their part. It's a plan months in the making, and one that, if it goes off without a hitch, could free their monstrous god into the world. They would strike at the very heart of their enemy, the SCP Foundation, when they least expect it. And nothing shall stand in their way. How could they lose when they have a god on their side? But why did all these normal people become violent zealots for a squid-faced deity? It all began with a dream. To those who experienced these dreams, they felt more like prophecies, premonitions of the glorious horrors to come. A red sky, billions dead, and billions more enslaved, a dark silhouette on the horizon. Their tentacled god holding dominion over all. At first, it just seemed like a strange nightmare. The ones who experienced it woke up shaken and afraid, hoping to shake the images from their mind, but they couldn't. Every night, the nightmare would return. They'd see the images, the red sky, the dead and enslaved, the tentacled god. And after a while, it would come to them even when they weren't asleep, eventually happening whenever they closed their eyes. Little by little, this scene stopped looking so hideous and started to look glorious. They felt his presence in their minds, slowly pushing them towards their inevitable future. They started to realize that they wanted him to rule over the universe and to experience the honor of serving him. Many of them abandoned their homes and families, leaving their friends and loved ones left to worry that they'd gone insane. In their eyes, they were safer than they'd ever been. They finally had purpose. They were working in service of something far greater than themselves. 
The influence of the tentacled god drew them closer to one another. They would meet in secret, exchanging information from the prophecies their ruler sent to them in their dreams. They worshipped together, building altars and idols to congregate around. They performed dark blood rituals involving human and animal sacrifice. It was when Brother Marsh, the Anointed One, arrived to guide them towards their true mission that things kicked into high gear. Just three months prior, Brother Marsh had been an office drone working in data entry for a large insurance company before the tentacled god invaded his thoughts with a simple message. Free me, and the new world I create shall be your playground. Since then, he devoted himself completely to the cause quitting his job and maxing out his credit cards to help fund his new life's purpose. Infiltrating the SCP Foundation and releasing his inhuman ruler from its imprisonment. That was the single goal he united the cultists under, freedom for the tentacled god. And at long last, they had all the pieces in place to strike. They'd finally gathered the necessary intel to subvert the will of the most powerful secret organization on Earth. Even the strongest institution is made of people, and people are weak. Unlike the almighty tentacled god, people could be broken. The people in question were Kelly Thompson, Sidney Levitt, Jordan Broche, Dr. Juan Gutierrez, and Jillian Larson. Dr. Juan Gutierrez was a researcher with level 3 clearance on the site where the tentacled god was being contained. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both security officers charged with verifying personnel clearance on site. Kelly Thompson was a member of Site Administration with Research Authorization Powers, and Jillian Larson was a research assistant who often collaborated with Dr. Gutierrez. These five were the key to getting access to SCP-2662 and bringing their plan to fruition. Normally, personnel dossiers on people working for the Foundation were highly confidential, but the devotees of the tentacled god had their ways. They had a number of computer experts in their ranks, more than capable of hacking in and pulling some basic information off of Foundation servers without being detected. For the other information they needed, they turned to some good old-fashioned torture, which is often the most effective method when you need some quick results. Of course, while the cult's grip on sanity may have been a little tenuous, they weren't stupid. While gathering their intel, they also made sure to find out what exactly they were up against. SCP-2662 was being held in a humanoid containment cell and guarded by on-site Task Force Tau-9, better known as the Belligerent Bodyguards. These aren't lazy, donut-chomping mall cops. These are a heavily trained, heavily armed fighting force. Though the cultists had one thing that these Foundation soldiers didn't, the element of surprise. For everything to go off perfectly, Brother Marsh's plans would have to be executed within a single day, and they were already on the clock. Tau-9 had been charged with tracking down any new SCP-2662 cults and dismantling them, and Brother Marsh knew that it was only a matter of time before the Foundation tracked them down and did the same to them. If they wanted any chance of freeing the tentacled god, then they'd need to strike quickly and with overwhelming force. The SCP-2662 worshippers were able to secure the addresses of the five key Foundation personnel and station members outside each of them, including one who could realistically imitate each. They waited for night to fall and broke into each of their homes as they slept. What followed was a sequence of ruthless and efficient murders done in the cause of freeing their god. Dr. Gutierrez was shot in the head while he slept. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both stabbed to death before either even realized what was happening. Thompson, who'd gotten up to use the bathroom, went down in a hail of machine gun fire. Jillian Larson had seen that masked figures were breaking into her home and attempted to flee, but was caught and beaten to death by cultists in her hallway. It was a strange irony that people whose day jobs entailed working with some of the most dangerous and nightmarish anomalies imaginable were murdered in their homes by nothing more than regular humans. So far, Brother Marsh's plan had gone perfectly, with all five key personnel murdered within a two-minute period. Next, the selected doppelgangers stole clothes from their victims' closets and were handed the correct forged documentation. 
The next morning, each replacement began their journeys to the site where the tentacled god was being contained, while the rest of the cult armed themselves in preparation for their own part in the plan. Nobody at the Foundation seemed to notice anything amiss when the five arrived on site. When you work for the SCP Foundation, more mental energy is devoted to following the rules that keep you alive than to memorizing the faces of all your co-workers, and each one slipped neatly into position, disappearing into the familiarity of office life. But infiltrating the site was one thing, getting past the belligerent bodyguards and into the cell of the tentacled god would be another thing entirely. That's where the rest of the cult would come into play. Heavily armed with whatever firearms they could get their hands on, the rest of the devotees of the tentacled god, Brother Marsh included, would attack the containment site head on. In the ensuing chaos, the five cultists who had already infiltrated the site could take advantage of the distraction and break into the containment chamber. It was perfect. They launched their attack from the outside and from within. When Brother Marsh declared that the time was right, the assault began. A legion of gun-wielding cultists seemed to spring out of nowhere and started shooting up the warehouse that was a front for the containment site. The site quickly mobilized guards and task force members to take on the sudden threat, and just as Brother Marsh had anticipated, the site director called on the majority of Tau-9 to help repel the violent cultists from their perimeter. Tau-9 obeyed, leaving three task force members behind to guard SCP-2662's containment chamber. They expected to be guarding the cell from rampaging religious zealots seeking an audience with their god. What they didn't expect was a group of five Foundation employees walking right up to them and opening fire, killing two Tau-9 members and taking the third as hostage. While the war was being waged outside, the infiltrators had found the tentacled god's containment cell in the low-risk humanoid ward. Their hostage insisted that using him wouldn't give them any leverage. The rest of his team would neutralize the whole group, him included, if that's what it took to stop them. The infiltrators explained that using him as leverage was never their intention. He wasn't a hostage at all. He was a sacrifice. The cultists of the tentacled god detonated explosives, creating a hole in the wall and finally giving them access to their deity. They climbed through and gazed upon him in awe. There stood SCP-2662, twice as tall as a regular man, with ten huge tentacles emerging from its back. In their months of envisioning this creature, they pictured it sitting on a throne made of thousands of human bones, ready to dictate its commands to the obedient liberators. What they certainly didn't expect was to see the tentacled god hunched over a computer screen. Still, gods work in mysterious ways. So they stuck to the plan and began chanting. They pulled out a sacrificial dagger and began sacrificing their captured Tau-9 member. It was at this point that SCP-2662 turned and saw what they were doing with a look of pure horror. He rose up from his computer, his headphones getting caught as he did so. He told them to go away, that he didn't want them here, and that them murdering people in his bedroom like this was inconsiderate and disgusting. The cultists became even more confused. Why wasn't their god accepting their offerings? What were they doing wrong? They tried more chanting and painting arcane symbols on the floor in blood, but this just seemed to make the creature angrier. He told them, in a tone more fitting for a teenage boy than a Lovecraftian god, to just leave him alone so he could play his video games. This was seriously not cool. The cultists were baffled. They told the tentacled god that they were there to free him, he replied that he didn't need saving, that crazy stalkers like them were why he turned himself into the Foundation in the first place. Before the cultist infiltrators could get another word in, the remaining members of Tau-9 stormed into the containment cell and gunned them down with surgical precision. The war outside was already over. Brother Marsh and the rest of the cultists were all killed in the firefight. Tau-9 didn't look the least bit surprised upon entering 2662's cell. This was a common occurrence, unfortunately. They had to deal with an attempted cult invasion every few months, because SCP-2662's main anomalous ability is inspiring violent cults who relentlessly track down and worship it with arcane and bloodthirsty rituals. The problem is, 2662 doesn't do this consciously, 
and definitely doesn't like the results. That's why he's under the voluntary care of the SCP Foundation, who keeps him amused with video games and reading material, while fending off the deranged cults who try to invade and abduct him. Following the termination of the devotees of the Tentacle God, just one of many cults who'd broken into 2662's containment cell, the remaining Tau-9 members apologized to the tentacled creature for the disturbance, allowing him to return to his gaming. They assured him that it'd probably be at least a few more months before something like this happened again. SCP-2662's cell was repaired, and the Foundation returned to its task of seeking out would-be cult emancipators, because for the SCP Foundation, it's not always about the anomaly that's being kept in containment, but what's being kept out. It's the late 90s, and an Air Canada flight experiences severe malfunctions while traveling from London to Vancouver. The pilots are unable to do anything and the plane crashes into the woods of northern Alberta. The crash was devastating. Only 10 of the nearly 300 people on board are alive. And even though they survived the initial disaster, their battle for life has only just begun. It's late autumn in northern Canada, and there's no telling when help will arrive, if at all. If the survivors want to make it through the night, they need to find shelter, and fast. As they trudge through the freezing woods, the group finds a path that looks like it might lead them to civilization. After all, if there was a path in the woods, that meant they were probably in a national park. And if they were in a national park, there had to be a ranger station around somewhere where they could warm up and call for help. They didn't have many other options, so they followed the path which opened up to a clearing. But instead of finding a ranger station or campground, they found something none of them could have expected. It was a pond, but there was something off about it. As they got closer, they saw that this strange pond wasn't filled with water, but blood. The survivors were horrified. That couldn't really be blood, could it? It must have been a weird algae or chemical reaction. But one member of the group, a man named Thomas Dean, who had been on his way back to his hometown of Prince George, British Columbia, thought there was something strangely familiar about this. He remembered being a boy and going to visit family in Alberta, and hearing an urban legend from the older local kids. According to the stories, somewhere out in the wilderness, in the northern part of the province, there was a pond full of human blood. And what made it even worse was that some said the pond was a gateway to hell. The SCP Foundation was also aware of this legend, and had been trying to pinpoint the exact source of it for decades prior to the Air Canada crash. They would finally receive definite confirmation of the blood pond when Foundation personnel intercepted a radio transmission from a ranger station located within the Wood Buffalo National Park. It was the survivors of the crash who had managed to make it through the night, and they were about to be escorted out of the park by rangers. The Foundation mobilized quickly to cordon off the pond, as at the time they were unsure of what potentially harmful properties the pond might have had. They set up Watch Station Epsilon 38 and put staff on guard to deter travelers from the area. The pond was given the designation of SCP-354 and classed as Euclid. Foundation scientists made a number of interesting discoveries about SCP-354 when they collected samples for testing. First, the pond was not in fact full of blood, merely an inorganic liquid that closely resembles blood in color and consistency. Second, and even stranger than the red liquid, is that the pond doesn't seem to have any definite banks or a bottom. Instead, the liquid in the pond increases in density as the radius away from the center increases. The liquid congeals at the edges, becoming more solid and blending into the surrounding soil. It also becomes thicker as one descends deeper into the pool, and a bottom of the pond has not yet been reached, if it even exists. Initially, the Foundation found no signs of life within the blood pond, but that would all change at 2.03 p.m. on the day following the opening of Watch Station Epsilon 38. When the science team noticed an unusual level of activity on the pond's surface, security footage feed showed a shape rising out of the pond, followed by a deafening shriek. After that, the feed was cut and Foundation lost all communication with Watch Station Epsilon 38. Fearing the worst, a mobile task force was dispatched to the location. When they got there, all personnel at the Watch Station had been killed by what could only be described as a gigantic bat. The task force was able to neutralize the entity, and as soon as they could, 
The foundation moved in to increase security around the SCP, creating Area 354 and installing a permanent security detail. After this point, the pond started to regularly spit out a variety of monstrous entities, almost as if it was reacting to the SCP Foundation's increased security measures. After SCP-354-1, the giant bat, came SCP-354-2. 354-2 was an echidna-like monster the size of a bear that was virtually bulletproof but unable to escape Area 354. The Foundation neutralized this anomaly with napalm. SCP-354-3 was a floating black sphere capable of firing deadly beams of concentrated energy. The area's head scientist was able to hit it with a sledgehammer, causing the sphere to malfunction and self-destruct before it was able to escape the area. The Foundation wasn't as lucky with SCP-354-4. This creature was a reptilian humanoid that stood roughly 15 feet tall and was unable to be put down with gunfire. This was the first creature from the pond to successfully escape containment, and was only able to be neutralized when the Foundation sent in Mobile Task Force Omega-7, also known as Pandora's Box. The data on pond incursions is partially corrupted, so a complete list of creatures is not available. But some of the other monsters that came out of the blood pond include a killer robot, a set of gigantic tentacles that drag several D-Class personnel into the pond, a pair of panther-like creatures, one made of ice and the other of magma, that ignored Foundation staff and instead fought each other, and one seemingly normal human man who was executed as soon as he emerged from the pond. Tests on his body revealed that he was, in fact, totally normal and would have posed no threat. These anomalies came out of the pond at fairly regular intervals for several months before the pond went silent for an unprecedented 22 months. The head scientist at the time noted, I suspect this means one of two things. Either the red pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is, or is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. His words would prove eerily prophetic following the events of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha. The Foundation's research and development team built a specialized craft to explore the pond. Because of the strange properties of the pond's density, the craft was essentially made to be both a submarine for parts of the pond where the contents were liquid and a drill for when the liquid congealed into a semi-solid towards the bottom. The exploration team consisted of Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, Leroy Tucker, and a pilot named Martin. With the team assembled, the ship was sent down into the pond. Nothing eventful happened for the first two days of the mission, but at 4.30 a.m. on the third day, gravity suddenly reversed for the crew of the ship. This seemed to indicate that they were approaching the halfway point, though what would be on the other side, nobody could say. On the fourth day, the ship surfaced, proving definitely that the pond was in fact some sort of portal. The crew looked out of the portholes to see the darkness of night above them. While sensors outside the ship detected nothing harmful in the atmosphere around them, the crew were wary of exiting the craft. The other side of the pond was nothing like the world the crew knew. For one thing, the night lasted for 28 hours before dawn came, and when the sun finally rose, it was much larger and redder than the Earth's sun. Under the light of the strange red star, the crew could see that the pond on this side was massive compared to what they've come into, more like a large lake. Surrounding the lake was sand and rocks that were covered in a kind of moss that disappeared under sunlight and regrew during the night. The team left the ship and started to explore. During their time in this strange world, they found that the day lasted just a few hours shorter than the night, meaning that whatever planet they were on had a roughly 43-hour long rotation as opposed to our own planet's 24. The team found a number of anomalous elements on their expedition, including razor-sharp grass that can puncture skin and streams of liquid carbon dioxide. They heard some loud roars in the distance once or twice, but other than that, the planet was eerily silent, with seemingly no animal life and not even wind. When it rained, the soil remained dry, and based on that, the scientists theorized the plants in this world were more efficient at absorbing moisture. On the 25th day, the team ran into a huge metal wall that appeared to be artificially constructed. Luckily, Leroy Tucker, a quick-thinking researcher, was able to rig a blowtorch from camping supplies and melt a hole through the metal. On the other side, there was finally wind and odd black grass. 
That's the extent of what is known about the other side of the wall, because the expedition logs are heavily corrupted after that point. But we know that whatever was in there wasn't good, because the team never returned. Strangely, there's no record of any names mentioned in the ship's log, almost as if being killed on the other side completely erased them from history. No other expeditions into the pond were launched after that. On an undisclosed date, a year following the discovery of the Blood Pond and construction of Area 354, the site was completely evacuated, and power was cut to the area. Mobile Task Force Data 12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation, but before contact could be established, the area's on-site nuclear warhead was detonated, completely destroying the site. MTF Theta-12 was then attacked by a convoy made up of D-Class and other low-ranking staff who had evacuated Area 354. It was apparent that there had been some kind of mutiny within the site, and that a dissolution of the chain of command had led to its evacuation and destruction. The convoy totally annihilated MTF Theta-12, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Following the site's detonation, a new site was constructed called simply the Red Pool Containment Site. Unlike the previous facility, which focused on research and neutralization, the new site is entirely concerned with containment. The shift in directive came as a response to the pond's apparent reactive nature. Each creature that emerged from the pond seemed to be in retaliation to the Foundation's actions, and it was theorized by some that the mutiny at Area 354 was triggered by some kind of psychic attack from the pond itself. An interview in the SCP file on 354 reveals that there was one more disastrous attempt to control and understand the blood pond. According to an interview with a Foundation agent, the head doctor proposed a scheme to drain the blood pond using a system of pumps and hoses. All non-essential personnel were evacuated in case of emergency, leaving only the pump technicians, D-Class personnel, and a few agents for security. However, as soon as the pump was scheduled to be turned on, everyone at the site experienced a mass dissociative episode. The agent described the feeling they all experienced as like being in a dream and suddenly realizing that you're asleep. He said, Everything stopped being real. It was like we had to escape right now. When asked what happened when the pump was turned on, he simply explained that it wouldn't let them. This interview confirmed the theory that the pond is not only capable of releasing monsters out into our world, but also that it's capable of powerful but much more subtle psychological attacks. This suggests a chilling possibility, that the pond isn't just blindly reacting to being attacked, but it's fully sentient, and the actions of the SCP Foundation have only served to annoy it. And worst, studies of the pond's banks have proved evidence that the area of congealed liquid around the perimeter of the pond has been steadily expanding. That's right, the pond is getting bigger. The last thing the Foundation agent stationed at the site said before being dragged out of the interview and sedated was, It gets bigger and stronger every day, and now we've made it angry. The entity that is SCP-4840-A is an old man who calls himself the caretaker of the floating city of Autodopodopolis. He holds secrets that will change the Foundation's understanding of the world forever. The old man was initially encountered by Captain Francis Pike, who first explored Autodopodopolis for the Foundation. It was here that SCP-4840-A provided some insight into the city and its mysteries. Over a decade later, the Foundation has sent Dr. Val Ostorovich to interview the old man. Unbeknownst to her, everything she and everyone else thinks they know is about to change. SCP-4840-A walks into the room where Dr. Ostorovich sits. Please take a seat, she says to the old man. He looks around at the barren stone walls and takes a few steps into the center of the room. Dr. Ostorovich motions to the chair across the table from her. The old man pulls the chair out and takes a seat. Dr. Ostorovich leans over and pushes a button on the voice recorder resting on the table. That's very impressive, the old man says, examining the device. So it records everything I say? That is correct, responds Dr. Ostorovich. The old man looks around the room and then directly into her eyes. A smile cracks his lips. I wondered when the Foundation would want to talk. Like, actually talk. You are a seeker of knowledge. You reminded me a little of my brother. He may have been the greatest scholar that ever lived, and now you seek the truth. For that, we will need to take a journey billions of years into the past. Billions? asked Dr. Ostorovich. Billions? The old man answers, folding his hands onto the table. I was there from the beginning. 
the old man begins to tell his tale. It is so vividly worded that Dr. Ostarovich feels like she is living in the story, like she's been transported to a different time and place to experience the creation of the universe and the fall of man. In the beginning, there was light. The Iron God manifested itself. His sword cut flaming stars into the sky. The God of Flesh sprinkled drops of blood onto the earth, creating the first life. The Serpent of Sin and its dark brother laid the foundation for what is and what is not. A young boy looked up at the sky as the earth began to turn. He watched the creation of everything from the Great Hall of Autodopodopolis. This was where humans were born. Wait, I don't understand, says Dr. Ostarovich. Are you telling me that Autodopodopolis is like the Garden of Eden? I am not telling you that it is like anything, the old man says with a wink. But I think you want to learn more about a different tale, something I will get to in time. In the early days of the universe, there were only a few humans in existence. For millions of years, they watched through the haze of creation to learn more about the reality they were born into. They built the very first city, and upon completion, it became the spot where that which is came to be. There were only ever two true gods, is and is not. They were the only truths in the entire universe. Is brought the serpent into the world. It searched for whence it came and to learn about all the truths that had been hidden from it. The is not was the darker shadow of is. It controlled everything that stretched out beyond the world and into the unknown. The two gods could not exist without one another. When you refer to the serpent, do you mean the entity that resides in the Wanderer's Library? interjects Dr. Ostarovich. One and the same, replies the old man. It was during the time after the is and is not finished creation that the monsters and demons inhabited the Earth. However, there was order. The monsters of other worlds were kept separate. These entities would be in the dreams of men, but were never able to cross over to their world. It was the strange folk to the west of Anadopodopolis that first opened their eyes to the cosmos. They were created from the last remnants of the Is, but were not human. They were something that could not be explained by logic. The humans were looked after by the mothers of the newly created world. The wolf, the bear, the sow, and the lion were their protectors. As the days went on and more men and women walked the streets of Autodopodopolis, they met in the great hall of the city, where they would seek counsel and listen to the first king of men. His name was Asim, which came from the word that meant is. His skin looked as if it were made of gold, and he had power beyond imagining. Although Asim was only a man, he could create mountains with his hands and deep oceans with his feet. He had a lance that could kill even the gods. Assem was a great leader, but deep inside of him grew the first vice of men, envy. He would look to the heavens and desire them to be his. Humans had built the greatest city that would ever be, and yet the king wanted more, so he took it. Assem was the first being to seize something from a world that was not his own. He stole a crown, and when he gathered the inhabitants of Autodopodopolis to the Great Hall to show them his new relic, he declared himself the king of all that is. He built a seat of power on top of the spot where mankind first found is. Assem was still kind to the people of Autodopodopolis, but he always desired more. Then the great betrayals came. Assem's sons grew up in the shadow of their father's envy. The first betrayal was by his middle son, who coveted his father's crown. He demanded that it be passed on to him, and when Assem refused, the son amassed an army and laid siege to the world. But the middle son was struck down by his father and locked in a stone tomb deep under the grounds of Autodopodopolis. The second betrayal came from Assem's oldest son. He went behind his father's back and spoke passionately to the people using sense and reason to demand that they make his father give him the crown. The people of Earth worshipped Assem's oldest son as if he were a god. Seeing this, Assem removed the poison that his eldest son had put into their minds. He then dealt with him by casting his son to the most desolate place on Earth, where he would wander until the sun went down in the east. The most devastating betrayal of all came from the youngest son of Assem. He came into his father's bedroom while he slept and took the crown from his head. 
The youngest son and his followers ran away with the crown. When Assem awoke, his heart broke with what his youngest son, whom he loved more than anyone or anything in the entire world, had done. An endless rage welled up in the king, and he turned the earth into a smoking wasteland. Assem searched tirelessly for his youngest offspring and the crown. His envy knew no bounds, and he desired nothing more than for his crown to be returned to him. For thousands of years, Assem searched but could not find what he was looking for. The crown had been hidden away and slowly faded into legend. The world gradually returned to normal. Fields began to regrow and forests sprouted from the smoldering embers of the planet's wide siege that Assem had carried out in search of his crown. The followers of his youngest son spread across the region, which would later become known as Europe. Then came the time of endless wars. Men fought demons and monsters. Men fought one another. From these wars came the deaths of many and the ancient ruins that have long since been consumed by the sands of the earth. But these wars would lead to the current age of human history. During the Great Wars, one man hid and watched from the Great Hall at Autodopodopolis. He witnessed the world consume itself, but the worst was yet to come. Zorus, the Sky King, found his way to Autodopodopolis and demanded that he be given the Lance of Essem. However, the Lance had been lost long ago with the fall of the first king of man as he ravaged the planet looking for his crown. Zorus refused to believe that the lance was not in the city and began to destroy Autodopodopolis as he looked for it. But before Zorus could completely demolish everything, a hidden mystery was called upon to stop the threat. The last of the titans, the great dragon Bahrath, who slumbered beneath the city, emerged from the earth and carried Autodopodopolis into the sky forever separating it from the men of the world. You mean, until the Foundation discovered it, says Dr. Ostarovich. Well, yes and no, replies the old man. That was one before you. The history of man progressed. Deva, hero of Gilgamesh, killed Saras II's only son in single combat on the fields of Jerusalem. The dreaded sorcerer Noah el Menthoth flooded the lands until he was killed by Maladru, the wrathful. Jorai Apollyon sailed across the Great Sea to meet with the king of the Night Children, but was buried alive to feed the heart of their tree goddess. Then from the east came Lancelot. Like the knight from King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table? asked Dr. Ostarovich. The old man frowns. No, oh, that was a different Lancelot. The one who came to the floating city was called the Demon Lancelot. As the demon Lancelot approached Autodopodopolis, any remaining allies who still walked the earth were called upon for assistance. The evil army that the demon commanded would not be easily defeated. Lancelot first targeted Bathrada, the old dragon who had lifted Autodopodopolis into the skies. Next, he battled the sea lord, Arcturius. He made quick work of the hero Beowulf, and lastly fell the king of David. All that remained between the demon Lancelot and the city of Autodopodopolis was one human. He took up his sword and battled the demon, but Lancelot was too strong. The demon used the flails attached to his six arms to demolish anything in his path. He was about to land the deadly blow when with its last breath, the dragon Bathrada ripped the demon Lancelot's heart out of his chest and cast him into the Temple of Sunset, where his dead body lies to this day. All was now quiet in Autodopodopolis. The gods and heroes of old had been lost or were hidden away. The search for the crown continued on, and even Asim himself is somewhere scouring the earth for his precious relic. The floating city of Autodopodopolis was forgotten. So, basically most of the SCPs that the Foundation contains come straight from your history, Dr. Ostarovich says. Yes, I believe you are correct, replies the old man. Just from this story alone, there must be entities you recognize. And the fact that many of the gods, early men, and demons are immortal means you will probably hear more about them in time. The demon Lancelot may seem dead, but his body still radiates heat. I feel it is only a matter of time until we must do battle once again. Okay, there is something I don't understand, Dr. Ostarovich says. The old man nods at her. Where do you fit into this story? I understand you were there at creation, but you know so much and I can't help but feel you are leaving something out. The old man pauses. He lets out a long sigh. My name is Seth, the old man says. Brother to Cain and Abel, son of Adam el 
the first king of men. I was the king's youngest who stole the crown. I was the one who looked at the night sky and asked my father for a star all my own. He pulled one out of the heavens for me, and it became the iron crown. It drove my father to madness, my brothers to butchery, and led to the ruination of our kingdom. The crown is the seed at the root of all evil. Seth stares blankly across the room, and it was meant as a gift for me. It sailed through space at an unimaginable speed. A grand mechanical construction unlike anything we'd ever seen on our planet. A terrifying weapon to end all weapons. Oppenheimer said of the atomic bomb, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. But comparatively, this device made the atom bomb look like little more than a cherry bomb. This deadly machine's orders were simple. Take a direct course to Earth, activate, and wipe out all life. Leave the planet barren, with not even the smallest squirming microbes remaining. And this device, this destroyer, was more than capable of accomplishing this task. It'd been smooth sailing for millions of miles. All diagnostics were looking positive. Within a mere decade or so, the human race would be purged from the cosmos. Then, faster than the pre-programmed destroyer could react, a huge yellowish-green shape appeared in front of it. The destroyer's mysterious creators, in their not-quite-infinite intelligence, had planned for all of the major celestial bodies in Earth's solar system, including Jupiter, but for reasons unknown, they hadn't calculated the presence of Io, Jupiter's third-largest Galilean moon. The destroyer struck it at incredible speed, causing a mighty explosion and completely altering its perfect trajectory. Alarms were sounding as the destroyer hurled down onto the lower atmosphere of Jupiter. This alteration was unprecedented. Mayday. Mayday. In some distant galaxy, screens were flashing red, and the creators suddenly registered that this mission may not be so simple after all. They would need to make adjustments. The impact into Jupiter triggered the destroyer's attack protocol. Drawing from its limitless energy source, it activated its hyper-advanced antimatter weaponry, causing spatial disruptions and atmospheric shifts that created a huge red vortex on the surface of the gas giant, one that would later become known to Earth-based astronomers as the Great Red Spot. It's 16,350 kilometers wide, which is 1.3 times the size of planet Earth, and it exists as a kind of hell that almost no being could endure. A constant swirling nightmare with 432 km per hour wind speeds. In other words, the exact kind of nightmare it would have turned Earth into if ever it had reached its actual intended destination. But no matter, this was just a minor setback, all things considered. Such contingencies had been planned for from the start. The creators, back in the Triangulum Galaxy, roughly 3 million light years away from the Milky Way, simply began transmitting new orders to the crashed, malfunctioning destroyer. Unit is damaged. Repair. And that's exactly what it began to do. It's unknown how they were able to communicate, let alone travel over such a vast distance. But systems that would be impossible to even explain to humans suddenly began to kick in. It released a legion of hardy, self-made octopod repair drones that began to search for the machine's missing parts presumably hidden within the gases of Jupiter, or pulled in by the gravity of its nearby moons. Other drones would remain at the destroyer's side, conducting repairs and guiding its vital systems. Presumably to this machine and its creators, humans are like mayflies, insignificant creatures with such tiny lifespans. Here today, gone tomorrow. The machine would conduct its repairs and be upon us within a mere few centuries, barely even diverting from the schedule. The one thing the creators didn't anticipate was the formation of a little organization called the SCP Foundation, perhaps the only hope humanity has in repelling this doomsday weapon. The question we need to answer today is, will they be enough? Terrifyingly, this device has been intent on our destruction since long before the SCP Foundation was even a glint in humanity's eye. It entered our solar system and crashed on Jupiter all the way back in 1665. We know this thanks to the writings of Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini, who recorded detailed notes in his journal, 
on what we would later dub SCP-2399. On October 8, 1665, he wrote, I have observed something extraordinary in the heavens. The last night, as I gazed through my looking glass, I saw what appeared to be a star of great luminescence streak through the far reaches of our solar system. I have never recorded an object moving so fast. It had surpassed the outer planets in fewer than two hours. As I watched by my own two eyes, I saw it slow as it closed on Jupiter, make a sharp turn and disappear into the planet itself. I saw many bursts of light afterwards, but although I could continue to peer at it until the sun broke, I saw no additional disturbances in the night sky. I must continue to document that these are changes and will alert my colleagues when the day is upon me. On October 15th, I took Peter to my observation point the last night, but a week from the last night I saw the fire rain upon Jupiter in the heavens. He brought along his own looking glass, and together we aimed our view upon the giant. To our surprise, a magnificent change had occurred. Where once the distant world only showed bands of color, there was now a great red spot where the star came to rest on the surface of a Jupiter. Peter was incredulous, of course, that such an amazing discovery could have taken place before our very eyes. I will continue to take note of this. On October 18th, the night as I peered through my looking glass, I swear on my life that I observed what I looked to me like explosions and starbursts emanating from our red spot. I fear my mind is playing tricks on me, for there has been no record of such a violent outburst by a heavenly body since the dawn of astronomy. I will consult with Peter on the morrow, and hopefully glean from him some advice on the matter. On October 19th, Peter sees the same as I. As I approach him with my concerns, he leveled the same with me, and through our following discussion we concluded that there must be a powerful reaction to the falling star I saw upon the first night and not the product of our own shortcomings. I am left wondering what cataclysmic event must be taking place upon our heavenly neighbor. Our work to document this must go on. And the work of documenting SCP-2399 has indeed gone on for centuries, just as the machine itself has never once ceased in its extensive repairs. It was first spotted by modern humanity and by extension the SCP Foundation in 1963. As soon as the technology existed to send satellites up to Jupiter, the Foundation began studying this frightening new foe up close, trying to get the true measure of its abilities. They discovered that the weapon has a mysterious internal power supply that seems impossible to run down, as well as an advanced targeting system, self-repair abilities, antimatter weapons, and matter-disrupting capabilities. It also appears to have advanced shielding systems that make destroying it currently impossible. And seeing as it's a massive piece of military machinery 514.18 million miles away from Earth, it's impossible to truly contain. That's why the Foundation has rearranged its priorities into two new prongs regarding SCP-2399. The first is suppressing information to avoid panic. In order to achieve this, the Foundation has embedded agents in all major observatories to suppress any sightings of the machine, and has also been conducting an active disinformation campaign to keep it out of the public consciousness. The second prong of their containment procedure is cutting off the transmissions between the Destroyer's creators in the Triangulum Galaxy and the Destroyer itself. Actually achieving this goal took a miraculous feat in aerospace engineering the Barrier Satellite Array. This was an unprecedented long-range satellite array positioned in Jupiter's higher orbit, designed for the specific purpose of blocking the electromagnetic transmissions inbound for the destroyer. These messages are intercepted, decoded, and logged on the Foundation database. The satellites have also been granted some minor offensive capabilities for use in extreme emergencies. SCP-2399 has been given the Keter class due to its unique containment difficulties. It's also been given Disruption Class Amida, for the hefty possibility that reaching Earth could result in an SK Class Barren Earth End of the World scenario. On top of that, it has been given the Risk Class Danger, due to the very high potential of all of this actually coming to pass. The biggest concern for the Foundation at present is the accelerating rate of repair that the Destroyer seems to be exhibiting. Back when they first observed the Destroyer up close, it was repairing itself at a rate of 0.12%. However, that rate of repair has now risen to 0.78% annually. 
According to all known metrics, its current level of functionality appears to be 59%. If it ever reaches 75%, then, to put it mildly, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble. Current projections say this is incredibly likely to occur in the next 25 years, and if we don't figure out a way to stop it before then, the Earth is doomed. The SCP Foundation received a chilling wake-up call about the severity of the situation when one of the barrier units noticed one of the destroyer's repair drones zeroing in on a piece of debris that seemed to be part of the destroyer's communications array. Considering that the Foundation's main weapon against the destroyer right now is blocking its communication capabilities, allowing it to repair its communications array would be an unacceptable failure. Because of this, Barrier Unit 53 was ordered to fire its onboard concussion batteries at the drone in hopes of destroying it, or at least impeding its progress. This was met by swift and severe prevention and retaliation from the destroyer. It fired its own defensive charges, destroying Barrier Unit 53's payload five kilometers away from the repair drone. It subsequently destroyed Barrier Unit 53, as well as several other barrier satellites that just so happened to be in its vicinity. This led to an order that no barrier units are permitted to engage the repair drones, for fear that this would lead to even greater losses. The next attempt to fight back against SCP-2399 went by the name Project Gigas. This was a joint project between the SCP Foundation and 45 different nations, with the goal of using sheer, raw firepower to destroy or at least utterly incapacitate SCP-2399. They would place almost 100 massive nuclear warheads on Europa, Jupiter's smallest Galilean moon, each one fitted with EMP detonators to impede the destroyer's defense systems. They would hit it with so much nuclear hellfire that it surely would be destroyed. Naturally, when this failed to meaningfully damage the destroyer, the Foundation returned to the drawing board, daunted by the enormity of the task before them. The way they saw it, there was only one viable option left. Protocol Legionnaire. Randall McAllen, the director of the Barrier Project, released the following haunting memo on the subject. So, SCP-2399. Have you ever sat and wondered, maybe after you hear about a car accident on a street you were just on, or a bombing in a city you were visiting, just how lucky you are to be alive? Just how many things have to go right for you to continue to exist? A few seconds too late, a few seconds too early, and somebody reaches for something they dropped, and a busload of people run into another busload of people. Sometimes this kind of thing does happen, as we've seen far too often, but that's what we're here for, to protect those who can't protect themselves from things that they wouldn't even know to protect themselves from. We can't do it all, though. As many things as we've been able to contain, as many things as we've been able to keep under lock that would threaten to destroy us all, still far too many remain that we can't do anything about. Whether they're too big or too fast or too powerful, any of these things could blink and wipe humanity from existence. The fact that they haven't done so yet is just luck. SCP-2399 is, however, different. We have little information regarding SCP-2399's motives, origins, and full capabilities. We do not understand how it is capable of communicating over such large distances, or why those who constructed it, if it was in fact constructed, sent it to us in the first place. We do not know what would happen if SCP-2399 is able to fully repair itself, or if part of our array would break down and any message would get through. We do not know this, so we must assume the worst. Judging by what we've seen, were SCP-2399 to have reached Earth, it would have led to our timely destruction. But sometimes humanity gets a little help. Sometimes something steps in the way of the apocalypse. For us and for SCP-2399, it was Jupiter. As SCP-2399 began to slow on its approach to Earth, Cassini saw what we've been able to ascertain that SCP-2399 struck Io, was damaged, and was unable to escape the gravitational pull of Jupiter. Its weapons activated as they were intended, but it was Jupiter that experienced Doomsday, not us. Eventually, though, it is likely that SCP-2399 will resume full functionality, and will likely be able to pull away from Jupiter and proceed to its target. 
As of now, we can keep hurtling bombs and EMPs at it all we want, but we've got no indication that any of it will so much as scratch the thing. On the contrary, experience dictates that it would do nothing at all. If this were to happen now, we would undoubtedly be destroyed. Jupiter has given us some time. For now, SCP-2399 will remain there, reassembling itself while we devise some way to stop it. Like it or not, we are in an arms race with this thing. Our best guesses give us something like 25 years until it is able to hear past our dampening array. Until then, we must seize the opportunity that has been laid before us. We must use the time we have been given and not let it be wasted. So we devise Protocol Legionnaire, one gigantic EMP, powered by God knows what, followed by a volley of nukes big enough to wipe out our civilization a thousand times over. A blunt plan, and simple, and likely futile. Our researchers and researchers around the globe have yet to devise even a way to deliver that kind of pulse, let alone a way to power it. There is no indication whatsoever that we will be able to complete Legionnaire on time, or if it will do what it is intended once it is completed. But we must try. We must do something. Even if we have to drain our banks and empty our minds, we must try. Not often do we get the chance to see the swerving bus that will end our lives and step out of the way. Jupiter unknowingly has offered us that chance. I suggest we take it. You're probably wondering, why is McAllen approaching this situation with such desperate urgency? Well, it's because in 1996 and again in 2015, the message that the destroyer has been receiving changed. It was no longer a simple order to repair. The message now read, Unit is out of range of target. Proceed to planet number three in system. Priority is target. Cease repairs. And if that message ever gets through, time is already up for all of us. Can a thought be infectious? Is it possible that transferring an idea can happen as easily as catching the common cold? Someone gets it, then transmits it to another person who then passes it on to someone else and so on. Imagine for a moment that information is a disease. We can't see information or feel it. We can read it in books or on the internet, but actually seeing it or feeling it inside our heads is impossible. So what if something could taint the information we absorb? Use it to slip its way undetected into your mind, then pass from you to your friends, your family, your co-workers. How would you know it was there, and how could you prevent it from getting into your head? Perhaps it's time you were introduced to SCP-3002. Over its many years of studying and containing anomalous beings and entities, the SCP Foundation has encountered a number of creatures with memetic abilities. If you are unfamiliar with the term, memetic usually refers to data or information that has been manipulated in order to influence or subconsciously change a person's behavior. This can take any form, from text and images to spoken phrases and other audio. For example, a form of memetic influence we have all experienced at some point is product placement. If you ever watched a character in a movie or on TV using a certain product, then that may have made you decide that you want to buy that same product for yourself. That idea was planted in your head by something you saw, and had a subliminal influence on your behavior. SCP-3002 is one such entity that uses mimetic stimuli for its own nefarious purposes. Some anomalies, like SCP-2440, use mimetic information to spread knowledge of themselves among human beings getting stronger the more people learn about it. SCP-3002, on the other hand, is information. This entity is a thought, a living, sentient thought, with a number of abilities that allow it to influence the minds of human beings. It is hard to picture a thought, let alone one that is alive. Since we can't see information, the idea of something so abstract having a tangible form boggles the mind. SCP-3002 is capable of shape-shifting, and while it does not possess its own consistent shape, the entity is able to transform itself into the form of any piece of information it chooses. Existing as pure information means that it is intangible to any beings that possess physical bodies. But what makes SCP-3002 a threat to everyone at the Foundation and earn this entity its Keter classification is its power to manipulate a person's mind or memories. 
allowing SCP-3002 to directly enter human minds. Moving at the speed that thoughts can travel through the brain, this entity is almost impossible to kill or kept contained. SCP-3002 can spread like a sickness through a human population, attacking new minds and taking control of its victims. According to the Foundation's research, there is only one way to remove the influence of SCP-3002. Anyone that comes under the control of this entity has to undergo complex, intricate, and risky brain surgery in order to physically remove the entity from their minds. However, the Foundation considers this method to be impractical, time-consuming, cost and effective, and is rendered utterly pointless if SCP-3002 has infected too much of a subject's mind. So instead, in order to prevent the spread of SCP-3002's influence, all Foundation personnel are instructed to terminate any person contaminated by this living thought. This order is extended to that individual's family, friends, colleagues, and even acquaintances. Given that SCP-3002 can take the form of any information it chooses, written words, a sound, even a telepathic signal, Anyone even remotely linked to someone the entity infects has to be destroyed to stop any potential spread. If you or anyone you knew were to come into contact with SCP-3002, the entity would be able to take control of your entire consciousness. All your memories would be ripe for the entity's picking. SCP-3002 is able to sift through your temporal lobe where memories are stored, and can not only destroy and delete an infected person's memories, but can also create false memories to replace them. And all the while, you would be completely unaware that this was happening to you, stripped of all your natural survival instincts while SCP-3002 runs riot in your brain. There is currently no known limit to how much of someone's mind SCP-3002 is able to mimic, rewrite, alter, or remove. When the entity alters one of your memories, that memory will become an additional instance of SCP-3002. In other words, it can implant itself in every moment of your life, making itself a part of everything you remember about your own personal past and even the parts you can't. Once SCP-3002 has spread itself to every piece of information stored inside your brain, the next stage of infection begins, and SCP-3002 is able to take full control of a person's body. Much like before, this could be happening to you without you ever being consciously aware of it. Usually this doesn't come to much, and infected victims will carry on their day-to-day -day lives, acting no different to how they would normally. That is, until SCP-3002 detects a new target that hasn't been infected yet. When this happens, any people previously exposed to SCP-3002 will collectively seek out the uncontaminated individual, capturing them. Once this happens, SCP-3002's infected army will force their new victim to join them. The SCP Foundation considers SCP-3002 to be extremely hostile and a major threat to their organization and the world at large. Due to SCP-3002 being uncontainable and able to infinitely adapt, it has evaded capture or termination for a considerable length of time. Having the ability to spread among human beings via the information we share with each other – speech, texts, emails, phone calls, any information at all – means that potentially any and all information could contain SCP-3002. According to calculations of the Foundation's top researchers, 78% of humanity may be under the influence of SCP-3002 without any awareness that they have been infected. While dangerous and unstoppable, SCP-3002 doesn't operate purely on instinct. It doesn't infect as many minds as it can just because it knows no other way. Everything that SCP-3002 does is a premeditated, calculated decision with one nefarious intention, one goal to destroy the SCP Foundation from the inside out by killing or infecting every member of personnel. Believe it or not, SCP-3002 didn't begin life as a sentient infectious thought. In fact, SCP-3002 was once a person, a regular human being like you or I. She even had a name, Lily Veselka. It is widely believed that Lily Veselka became what we now know as SCP-3002 due to the actions of the Foundation itself. Since becoming SCP-3002, Lily seems to have been searching for any information she can find regarding a highly secret operation conducted by the SCP Foundation known as Project Lethe. 
As well as this, she appears to have an interest in a number of Foundation research facilities, including Site E and an off-the-books facility located in Ukraine's Yusaninskyi National Park. This is potentially where SCP-3002 was first created. If any of this is to be believed, then it would certainly explain SCP-3002's noticeable aggression towards the Foundation, and its attempts to infect its personnel as an act of revenge. After the project that turned Lily into a living thought, SCP-3002 was later encountered by the Foundation in its current form in South Rock Penitentiary. This prison, located near Lafayette, Indiana, was first visited by one Dr. Daryl Lloyd, one of the SCP Foundation's researchers. The prison psychiatrist, a woman named Dr. Suzanne Fairbank, was the first to notice the effects of SCP-3002 contamination on a number of South Rock Penitentiary's inmates. During sessions with her, several of these prisoners had mentioned an identical memory to Dr. Fairbank. The description of the memory from each of the inmates followed the same structure. The prisoner remembered taking a long walk through a forest with their best friend at the time. This detail, the best friend, is most likely SCP-3002 herself, imitating a figure from each inmate's own childhood memories. At some point in this false shared memory, all the prisoners recalled having an argument with their friend. It was later learned that the figure was Lily Veselka, approaching infected individuals in their memories to ask them questions about the project that had turned her into SCP-3002, often demanding to know, what do you know about me, or has the project finished? The Foundation began to investigate this bizarre instance of shared anomalous memory after Dr. Suzanne Fairbank shared her findings on an internet message board, describing what she had witnessed to other psychology experts. At first, Dr. Lloyd, the Foundation's researcher sent to South Rock to gather more information, labeled the situation as low-priority research. Given SCP-3002's ability to adapt and take the form of any information, it was able to avoid immediate detection by the SCP Foundation, and the full extent of Lily's abilities remained hidden. Dr. Lloyd originally classified SCP-3002 as safe, believing it was a little more than a shared childhood memory that the South Rock inmates had described. At first, those that had been infected with this collective memory were able to recount it with perfect accuracy. But as Dr. Lloyd continued to interview and test the affected inmates, the details became scarier and the memory became less and less defined the further the SCP Foundation looked into it. Perhaps Lily recognized the Foundation's presence and remembered that they were the ones responsible for turning her into a sentient mimetic entity without physical form and started hiding her tracks. Maybe she was biding herself time, hiding herself away in the minds of the infected prisoners until the time was right. Little did Dr. Lloyd realize at the time just how far SCP-3002's influence had already spread. Lily wasn't just in the inmates' heads, but almost all of the prison staff, too, who were now spreading her further and further without even realizing it. Thinking that SCP-3002 would be easy to contain, Dr. Lloyd had the Foundation administer amnestics to all the infected inmates. Amnestics are memory-altering drugs that the SCP Foundation uses to prevent any information about SCPs becoming known to the public. When dealing with mimetic anomalies like SCP-3002 or SCP-2440, amnestics can be particularly useful in removing a person's memories about a mimetic SCP. Dr. Lloyd hoped that this would be the case at South Rock, still thinking SCP-3002 was nothing more than an anomalous shared memory that could be removed. However, removing the false memory that Lily had implanted in the prisoners would not remove her from all their other memories. Additionally, one of the infected inmates was not given amnestics and was brought back to the Foundation for observation. From there, SCP-3002's influence had been able to spread like a sickness through the ranks of the Foundation's own personnel, without their knowledge or detection. Every person whose mind SCP-3002 is able to reach becomes an unwitting carrier for the infectious living thought. It is unknown exactly how many of the SCP Foundation's members are under the control of SCP-3002, granting Lily access to the wealth of secret information and plans that the Foundation keeps hidden. It doesn't matter what level of clearance someone would need to view it, 
If it's information, it's another way for SCP-3002 to spread. And information, as we know, can take any form, be it a written file, a spoken conversation, or even an informative YouTube video. Now tell me again about the time that we took a walk together in the forest. When you see some of the monsters and entities they try to contain, it's easy to think of the SCP Foundation as the good guys. And granted, when you observe the magnitude of threats like the Scarlet King, it's hard for anyone to not look like a downright moral paragon in comparison. But the Foundation aren't always knights in shining armor. Sometimes they themselves have committed horrific atrocities in order to keep their supernatural subjects under wraps and keep the rest of us safe from anomalous terror. Nowhere is that more clear than a deadly incident that occurred in 2010. The Foundation had been aware of the slow burn sloth for decades, and many believe that the entity has existed for as long as human beings have consumed visual media. Movies, TV, web pages, and even print media, like books and magazines, are vulnerable. Technically speaking, the name SCP-2774 refers to whatever visual medium is currently holding the true entity known as SCP-2774-A. Thankfully, SCP-2774-A has never made it onto the internet, where it could do truly catastrophic damage, but the Foundation has prepared for that possibility. They've invented a software program, Webcrawler A03G32, designed to constantly monitor all forms of online visual media for an appearance of SCP-2774-A. So. What is SCP-2774-A? What could possibly be so scary that even a picture of it leaking onto the internet could potentially lead to the collapse of human civilization? Simply put, SCP-2774-A is this image of an unknown humanoid entity in a bizarre sloth costume. While this picture may seem harmless, that's only because it's black and white, and any red or green hues have been neutralized from the image. Anyone who isn't red-green colorblind and somehow accidentally sees the true version of SCP-2774-A has a fate far worse than death in store for them. This is the same fate that would befall almost the entire population of the northern Canadian town of Harper Ridge in 2010. The residents of this small township were waking up and going about their morning. Some were getting ready for work, others enjoying a leisurely breakfast in front of the television set. All of those affected had unknowingly made the deadly mistake of watching the local news that morning. While the anchor droned on about some local economic statistics and delivered a dry advertisement for an upcoming town festival, the familiar image of something in the sloth costume appeared briefly on the set behind him. Most of the Harper Ridge residents who viewed the broadcast didn't even notice the sloth, but in that fateful instant, almost every single one of them was doomed. The slow burn sloth doesn't always affect everyone who sees it. Foundation scientists have found that it generally only affects 40% of people exposed to it, and doesn't affect those suffering from colorblindness at all. However, one of the more frightening details about the sloth, which is classified as a mimetic image SCP for its ability to spread and appear randomly almost anywhere, is that it grows more powerful and more contagious with every living victim it affects. After claiming a significant number of new victims, say from a small Canadian town, SCP-2774-A's infection rate can rise to as high as 60% or beyond. The residents of Harper Ridge made their own predator deadlier without even knowing it. At a nearby Foundation facility, units were already mobilizing. It was too late for those who had already seen the slow burned sloth, but others could potentially be saved if the situation was contained quickly. In addition to the web crawler constantly monitoring the internet, the SCP Foundation also had a huge number of dedicated teams scanning broadcasts worldwide for potential instances of SCP 2774 A exposure. When one of these teams detected the sloth's presence in Harper's Ridge's morning newscast, and found that upwards of 4,000 civilians had already been exposed, they knew there was no time to waste. Back in Harper Ridge, the situation was already deteriorating. A few hours had passed since the broadcast, and those who were exposed were beginning to experience strange symptoms already. First, it was a sense of tiredness and lethargy. Then, an unusual heaviness to their body, as though they were experiencing sudden, extreme muscle fatigue. 
People exposed to SCP-2774-A also experienced clouded cognition. Even thinking straight became a real struggle. It was at this point that the true effects of witnessing the slow burn sloth began to take hold, around six hours after initial exposure. Little by little, the infected lost all cognitive functions and higher level decision making abilities. Their bodies still acted out basic movements very slowly, seemingly just as a result of muscle memory, but they had no control over what was going on. They became, essentially, living zombies trapped in their own bodies and only dimly aware of it. This horrifying experience was completely consistent with prior Foundation research into the effects of viewing SCP-2774-A. And in a twist almost crueler than permanent zombification, victims of the slow burn sloth are randomly allocated around 150 seconds of lucidity every 24 hours before being forced back into their zombified state. Just as 4,000 of Harper Ridge's residents were beginning to experience these effects, all local communication channels to the town were cut off by the Foundation. Well-equipped teams of Mobile Task Force operators began arriving on the scene shortly after, accompanied by a number of containment units in the form of buses and trucks. Lucky for them, the zombified victims of the slow burn sloth were incredibly docile and compliant by nature. Shepherding all 4,000 of them into the containment units were almost like working with cattle. Some non-infected local residents attempted to protest the sudden abduction of their zombified loved ones. These residents were subdued and either had their memories wiped with Foundation amnestics or were terminated on site. Like with almost any conceivable situation, the SCP Foundation already had measures in place for a mass exposure event like this. All in all, a mere 4,000 was still on the low end of the potential infection scale. The 4,000 victims were secretly taken to Site-116, a Foundation testing site under the direction of Dr. Martin and his second-in-command, Dr. Clara Chung. There, they'd already been pursuing research on approximately 2,400 infected subjects from prior incidents, including Foundation personnel who were accidentally infected during the monitoring process. Thus far, it seemed that the condition caused by witnessing the slow burn sloth was incurable, and with 6,400 known living victims situated at Site 116, SCP 2774 A was at an unprecedented level of power. All site personnel were instructed to proceed with caution and carefully observe the behavior of their new test subjects. Dr. Chung spearheaded the majority of the hands on research into the infected residents of Harper Ridge and observed some interesting phenomenon in the victims' behavioral patterns as the condition escalated. The infected subjects, even in their largely zombified state, developed an almost fanatically religious obsession with the image of the slow-burned sloth. When left to their own devices, they would create idols of SCP-2774-A. These included amateur sculptures made of hoarded garbage, images drawn of the sloth with any materials they could get their hands on, or even writing obsessively about the sloth. Dr. Chung speculated that this behavior was perhaps an act of appeasement on the victim's part, hoping to somehow sate the slow burn sloth and lessen its effects on them through worship. However, she would later find out that the truth of the matter was far more disturbing. Initially due to their largely docile states, the subjects imprisoned in Site-116 were given a relatively long leash. The subjects were even allocated two hours a day for social interaction with fellow subjects at mealtimes and during a designated recreational period. During these times, the subjects would often trade their slow burn sloth effigies with one another. However, Dr. Chung revoked the social interaction periods and began confining the subjects to separate Euclid class containment cells when violence began to break out between them. It became clear that during their 150 second periods of lucidity every 24 hours, the subjects would become extremely distressed, agitated, and even aggressive. Dr. Chung also ordered any idols, from trash sculptures to doodles and notes on fragmented scraps of paper, to be destroyed immediately. At its new increased power, the Foundation became concerned that SCP-2774-A may develop the power to manifest through these images. No meaningful headway was being made on a cure for the condition, so something needed to be done before the situation got out of hand. In hopes of gaining a better understanding of the internal processes of slow burn sloth victims, 
Dr. Chung decided to conduct a series of interviews with the subjects under her care. Two such subjects, Subject 0866, aka David, and Subject 7444, aka Claire, were isolated for a 24-hour period in hopes of catching them during their daily 150 seconds of lucidity. Dr. Chung and the Foundation found the results of these two interviews to be as illuminating as they were utterly terrifying. When David regained lucidity, he was in a state of extreme agitation and showed an unsettling fixation on the clock in the Site-116 interview room. Under direct questioning from Dr. Chung, he revealed that slow burn sloth victims are fully aware of what's happening during their zombified periods. He compared the sensation to being a passenger, trapped and bound in a vehicle over which they have no control. However, in this state, victims are also unable to hold a thought consistently for longer than five seconds. This leaves them in an almost constant state of disorientation. Worse still, David describes that victims are subjected to near-constant hallucinations of the original sloth image, guiding and controlling their movements, almost like a puppeteer. Thanks to the clock, David was aware of when his 150 seconds of lucidity were about to come to an end. After apologizing for what he was about to do, David lunged at Dr. Chung, causing a guard present in the interview room to shoot him dead for Dr. Chung's protection. Dr. Chung's interview with Claire echoed the same sentiment. During her 150 seconds of lucidity, Claire first begged to be killed, before divulging further details about the zombification state. She would describe hallucinations of the slow burn sloth stalking her constantly and controlling her movements. In some cases, the sloth would force her to open her eyes all night, while it stands next to her bed and screams at her. As Claire's 150 seconds of lucidity ended and she became non-responsive, Dr. Chung put in a request for Claire's termination, a request that was fulfilled three days later. The third interview with Subject 9225, also known as Jason, showed that SCP-2774-A appeared to be manually starting the fights between the subjects, perhaps even for its own sadistic amusement. He also stated before the interview's conclusion that the image of the sloth and his hallucinations was becoming darker and more tangible, almost like it was becoming a real, physical being which was an unprecedented phenomenon. Dr. Chung was, for the first time in a while, truly afraid. It seemed by all accounts that SCP-2774-A's power was growing considerably as a result of its huge number of active victims. Its infection rate had likely risen well above 40%, and its ability to manifest would likely be on the rise, too. If the slow burn sloth was able to manifest on a national broadcast, millions would be infected to truly apocalyptic results. Dr. Chung only saw one solution that might curtail the entity's growing power, but it wouldn't be pretty. She devised a procedure known as Procedure XXJ9. As part of the procedure, additional staff were brought into Site-116 immediately. The real purpose of the plan was revealed shortly afterward. To reduce the number of active subjects on site from 6,400 to a mere 200 in hopes of reducing risk, over the next several days, staff at Site-116 engaged in the gruesome task of executing around 6,200 infected subjects via lethal injection. This was an atrocity so horrific, even by SCP Foundation standards, that Dr. Chung allowed the parties involved to use Class A amnestics to erase their memories of being involved in the mass murder of Site-116's subjects. In the aftermath of the call, the Foundation did report a decrease in SCP-2774-A's manifestations, so Dr. Chung's procedure did indeed work, just at a heavy human toll. The tragic incident of the 2010 Harper Ridge SCP-2774 containment breach is a grim reminder of just how far the SCP Foundation is willing to go to do their job, and a reminder to be careful where you look because some images have a much more lasting impact than others. The Foundation regularly deals with anomalies of a more sinister nature. The most frightening among these, of course, are the ones that stalk and kill Foundation operatives. For no clear rhyme or reason, sometimes the Foundation's agents and researchers become subject to things that seek to entrap and utterly consume them. Dr. Elizabeth Graham is one such poor soul. Nowadays, her name is whispered through mess halls and cubicles, since no one really seems to know what happened to her. One moment she was carrying a stack of files between two offices, the next completely gone. 
The Foundation security teams couldn't figure out what happened to her. The CCTV cameras just showed her blinking out of existence and the files falling to the floor. Her biometric scanners simply returned a dead signal. It seemed that one day, Dr. Graham simply ceased to exist. Of course, the Foundation isn't above keeping secrets from its own personnel. Perhaps they did find something. A series of SCP documents, covered in sand, suddenly appearing in Graham's office one day, neatly stacked and paperclipped, all signed by her in her own handwriting, and detailing her days spent in a pocket reality of some sort. It wouldn't be the first time it had happened. The infamous Red Reality incident with Dr. Robert Scranton had already upset researchers, and there was no reason to alarm them further about something they couldn't change. So Dr. Graham's papers were covered up and relegated to long-term storage, where they would likely never be thought of again. But don't you wonder, what happened to Dr. Graham? The first thing Dr. Graham felt when she woke up was confusion. She didn't remember falling asleep. In fact, she didn't remember much at all. She had been moving files between two offices at Site-22 on a normal workday. She said hello to some of her co-workers and had a late lunch before returning to work. And then, nothing. The second thing she felt was fear. She looked around and realized she was in some kind of desert. A bright blue sky was overhead, and there seemed to be a sun. But all around her was sand. Massive sand dunes, flowing sand plains, and even what looked like a sandstorm in the distance. But all there was, was sand. Dr. Graham then noticed she was still holding some things. A small folder, filled with paperclip documents. Pulling one out, she realized what it was. A template document for an SCP file, complete with sections for object class, containment procedures, and descriptions. This place was obviously not normal, but she had been anomalously transported to it. It needed to be documented. There was nothing else to do, so she sat down and began to write. She guessed at a number. Who knows what SCP the Foundation was on now. Might as well pick something for the middle. She scrawled SCP-3890 at the top and bubbled in Keter for the object class. The containment procedures were spartan, but effective. No effective measures of containment were possible, and she would focus on simply exploring and finding out what was going on. Then came the description. No point in sticking to the Foundation's signature clinical tone, given the circumstances. It was more important to get the information down, and so she began to transcribe her thoughts. SCP-3890 is a potentially extra-dimensional or extraterrestrial space which I, Dr. Elizabeth Graham, was somehow transported to from Site-22 on 2-17-16. I am uncertain as to whether I was transported here due to my involvement with the Foundation. After finishing the paragraph, she picked herself up off the sand dune she had landed on and started to walk in the direction of the sun. She didn't have much information and exploring would be necessary if she was to accurately document the anomaly. It didn't take long before she came across something in the distance. An old, collapsed temple, completely ruined from the outside, the structure sagging in on itself. It had the columns and facades of a Roman building, she noticed. Peering inside, it was completely empty, except for more sand. In the distance, more ruins were present some older, and some more modern office-looking buildings. In terms of geography, SCP-3890 takes the form of a seemingly infinite desert plain, with ruins of differing architectural design poking out through the sand. I have noted the presence of buildings of modern design, along with what appear to be ruins of ancient Roman and Eryxian structures. She only noticed the first figure when the sun started to set. As the sky shifted to twilight, she saw a person walking casting a long shadow. Excitedly, she yelled out to no response. When she approached, she saw a man in an older suit with completely lifeless eyes stumbling along. SCP-3890-1 is my collective designation for the humanoid entities that wander through SCP-3890. They do not respond to any stimuli, and as far as I've been able to tell, simply walk around without a specific destination. SCP-3890-1 are either entities that have been created to resemble humans but imperfect, or they are humans who have been mentally altered in some way to rob them of their faculties. There did seem to be some kind of a day-night cycle, and she didn't feel hungry or thirsty at all, though she did feel sleepy. 
After her first day in the desert, Dr. Graham settled in one of the collapsed ruins, drifting off to sleep. The second document opens much differently. This appears to be a document for something designated SCP-3890-2 Keter. The containment procedures are simply to always, constantly, be on guard for it, whatever it is. If Dr. Graham feels something she is approaching is not as it appears, she is to immediately retreat. The description is a little clearer. SCP-3890-2 is a living entity of varying shape and size, which resides in SCP-3890. I am uncertain as to whether SCP-3890-2 originates here, or if it was transported here at some point in the same way I was. From what I have observed of its behavior, it appears to be some form of predator. SCP-3890-2 is currently hunting me. I first encountered the entity shortly after writing down my initial observations of SCP-3890. It snuck up behind me while I was resting, and got me while I wasn't paying attention. I was knocked unconscious by its attack, and woke up several hours later during the night. It had attacked me several times since that first encounter, with several hours between each attack. She was caught off guard by it last night. She hadn't noticed its presence. It seemed to just be another building in the far-off horizon when she sat down and pulled out her pencil and paper again. She had started to fill in some more information about the humanoids. They seemed to continuously walk in circles around some of the ruins, though it was unclear to her why or even whether they were aware of what they were doing. But when she pulled her pencil out, she heard the buzzing in her head. It was like TV static, initially soft and low, but then ramping up and quickly becoming deafening stifling her ability to think. She looked up, and she saw it. For a moment, it retained its form as the building in the horizon, but that quickly changed. It began to unfold on itself, completely black on the inside, like a dark paper crane continually folding and unfolding, stretching and compressing in on itself. By the time Dr. Graham got to her feet and ran away, she began to realize what it had done and quickly scrawled it onto the paper. SCP-3890-2 uses amnestization as a form of attack. While it has not injured me physically thus far, I have lost all memory of significant chunks of my childhood and early adulthood. I can no longer recall which high school I went to or what my first job was. My current hypothesis is that, as an entity, it feeds upon memory. At first, Dr. Graham avoided buildings and stayed to the empty parts of the desert while walking. But when the creature appeared again, unfolding out of what seemed to be a piece of paper, it became clear what it was. A mimic. In the coming hours, it would pretend to be a star, a human, a fly, even a patch of dirt, while trying to make Graham come closer enough to consume her mind. The next document opens in even more dire circumstances. The containment procedures have shifted drastically. Containment now focuses on making sure that the mimic does not consume any memories that Dr. Graham cannot afford to lose. She is to write down all vital memories so she can recall them if they do get destroyed, and watch for its presence in situations and at all times. She writes the document while huddled in a vault in a bank dropped into SCP-3890, since it offers a little security from the creature, but the corpses of a family in the bank imply something less hopeful. They chose to die by their own hand, rather than let the Mimic get to them. Graham plans to kill anything that tries to enter the vault to ensure that the Mimic doesn't get in, but has bigger problems. I have lost all memories regarding how I came to be employed by the Foundation. I know that I am a Foundation researcher with level 3 clearance, but I simply cannot recall how I came to be in this position. Many of the SCP objects I worked with are also missing from my memory. I can tell there is a hole there, but I just don't know what was there before. Her memories of her own identity have been obliterated. Who she is, where she's from, what the Foundation even is, they have all been taken by the Mimic. Without fail, it manages to surprise her and consume an important memory, then dashing away as she tries to figure out what got stolen from her. Something small, like her favorite food or her childhood bedroom, or something foundational and fundamental, like her name and her sense of self. And avoiding it isn't an option. It can pretend to be any of the single grains of sand in the boundless desert, and Graham came to the conclusion, this is an infinite dimension of sand, serving as a hunting grounds for the Mimic. Of course, it could be anything else too. A brick, a window, any of the buildings, any of the mindless wandering people, or the clothes on Dr. Graham's back. 
Any of them could be the Mimic, and Graham thought of that too. It's why she hasn't let go of her knife in days. Even though it's dripping blood from examining the corpses of the former victims of SCP-3890-2. Even though she doesn't need to eat or drink, there is another concern. Sleep. The moment she falls asleep, the Mimic will no doubt be upon her. She hastily scribbled down a little bit more onto the paper before trying to rest. The sun's going down. I can't allow myself to fall asleep. 3890-2 will come in without a doubt if I do. I don't have to eat, I don't have to drink, but I still have to sleep. This place is designed for the Mimic's benefit. It can hunt its prey to its heart's content without them dying of thirst and starvation. Is this an enclosure, maybe? Some kind of sick game? My name is Elizabeth Graham. I can't forget that now. This page is my memory. The next word she writes on that paper shows something ominous. She can hear crying outside of her makeshift shelter. The next document things have changed. Someone named Tony is mentioned in the containment procedures. Someone Graham trusts to take watch while she sleeps and watches for the mimic. The descriptions explain. Tony is a child, only 10 years old, who fell into this dimension, the same as Graham, when walking home from the playground. The mimic can imitate objects, but it can't speak. The boy is real. They've worked on a rudimentary password system to confirm each other's identities regardless. Graham feels almost hopeful. Their chances of survival have doubled, even though they're being hunted. Not for their lives, but for the precious memories inside their heads. But she's still worried about other things. If people don't starve or thirst to death in SCP-3890, do they age? How long have the mindless humanoids been wandering around? How long has she been wandering around? Though she reminds herself of her training, she also faces the fact that she might have been exclusively picked for a past reason. I have this memory from my childhood still. Everything around it is gone, but it's sort of floating free, devoid of context. I'm visiting a woman in a hospital. I, I think it's a hospital, and I think it's a woman I know. A close relative? My mother or my grandmother, I think. And I go to visit her. I'm just a kid, 12, I think, and she doesn't know who I am at all. I don't remember what happened before that or after. Perhaps the Mimic brought her here because it knew she would hate having her mind consumed like this, but that would mean it wasn't just intelligent, that it was sadistic and cruel. She noted down she'd asked Tony if he had a similar experience, and they'd be a little closer to working it out. The document is hopeful. Dr. Graham now has something to believe in. The next document is a complete mess. Scribblings and scrawlings in the margins, and the text doesn't even begin to make any kind of sense. It's all word salad, the ravings of someone gone utterly insane. She mentions herself, her own name repeatedly and constantly, but in between are mentions of Tony, the Foundation, the Mimic, and everything in between. Dr. Graham has lost her grip on reality. That or whatever wrote this wasn't Dr. Elizabeth Graham. The document after that has a very simple containment procedures. She is to kill SCP-3890-2, the Mimic. Description. I woke up this morning. Tony was gone. He was the Mimic. It was smarter than I thought, I guess. I was stupid. I should have seen this coming, but I was desperate and it knew it. All it left was some scrawled document in a hole in my head the shape of my name. The Mimic, disguising itself as a child, had stolen the last thing she had left. Her name. All of Graham's precautions were useless. Even though her name was written down a dozen times in the last documentation, she cannot remember it. In fact, when she reads it, it immediately removes itself from her mind again. Not only has it taken her memory, it has taken her ability to reform them. And the document it left behind is one of her own, an SCP template. Though, of course, she doesn't know what the Foundation is anymore. The same document we have seen previously in the pile. Yes, the Mimic is learning to imitate Graham and getting better at it. Maybe that's why she hasn't been killed yet. It's yet to pin down her thought process and is waiting until it has her perfectly memorized. Not that she would know, given that she's forgotten how she even came here, or when. But the Mimic made a mistake. It took everything from her, even her hope which has left Dr. Elizabeth Graham a woman with nothing left to lose. She resolves, 
She will not get out of SCP-3890. The documents will probably wind back up in Foundation possession from some testing with an unrelated anomaly, but she will be a mindless husk, or worse. She plans to kill the Mimic. It's a cowardly, fearful stalker creature, and only hunts by pretending to be other things. She knows she can take it in a fight, and she still has her knife. The next document is Sober, the object class, neutralized. Dr. Graham walked boundlessly through the desert until the Mimic jumped for her. It unfolded from a cloud, turning into a mass of black origami and lunging for her. It didn't expect her to turn around and slash outward with her knife, piercing its strange black flesh. It let out a scream, shrank, and Dr. Graham realized that it could feel pain. So when it lunged again, she drove her knife deeper into it before pulling back. And she repeated the process until it was a tiny black mite in the sand, and then she crushed it under her heel. It was that easy, that simple. But of course, every time it had come close to her, it had taken another bite out of her mind, just as she took another slash at its form. We opened each other up. I filled its body with holes, and it filled my mind with them. There's not much left of me. She curses herself from not having done it earlier, but maybe there was a reason. She can't remember it anymore. In any case, the Mimic's dying bites from her were particularly damaging. The straw that broke the camel's back. What's left of Dr. Elizabeth Graham is falling apart. She scribbles things down onto the paper, while her mind realizes that she can't even understand what she's writing anymore. The next document is empty. Not every story with the Foundation's agents fighting a monster has a happy ending. Art, as it has been said, is often subjective. Whether it's a sculpture, an oil painting from the Renaissance, a renowned work of literature, a digitally drawn webcomic, or an insightful animated YouTube video about SCP Foundation lore. The deeper meaning behind a piece of art can often change depending on the individual observing it. Sometimes an artist intentionally makes the message of their artwork clear, hoping to have its meaning be unmistakable to any and all that might see it. Other times, such a meaning can be more ambiguous, harder to decipher without some serious thought. But either way, art is an important way that human beings interpret the world around us. It can be a reflection of emotions, experiences, history, and every new creation is as legitimate a piece of art as the last. But even with that being said, there may be no piece of art that is a better reflection of the world around us than SCP-804. Or to use its alternative title, The World Without Man. As you might have already guessed, SCP-804 is an art installation, or at the very least is what's left of an art installation. The piece itself, which was unveiled in Alaska, was created by a group of artists known by the name Inelmat Parmashta Maelmashta a Finnish phrase which translates to dreams of a better world in English. A fitting, highly appropriate name for a group that created SCP-804, given the subject of the piece. All that remains of the artwork itself is a portion of a once larger statue, sculpted to resemble the shape of a globe. Following extensive examination by the SCP Foundation's researchers, this globe has been determined to be most likely a recreation of our very own planet Earth. Originally, this globe was a large, clear model of Earth that also featured a number of smaller globes and video equipment inside of it. It appears then that this art installation may have been intended to function as a projector of sorts, displaying varying images of scenes from around the world. These images would have primarily focused on deserted and run-down areas of human society, such as abandoned buildings and decaying landmarks. The art piece seems to have depicted how even when we reshape our world and build cities, we can damage the planet's fragile ecosystem. This is especially prevalent when things we build are then later left empty, buildings rotting away, structures neglected to waste, this mass destruction of nature all in vain. These images would then have been contrasted with projections that show parts of the natural world that have yet to be touched by human beings. Serene, beautiful places like the corners of the Amazon rainforest or the deepest stretches of our oceans. The message of the piece? Well, we can only speculate, but it seems as if it played a role in highlighting the difference between the modern and natural world. So what could be so important about one leftover piece of a statue? How about this? When it was first unveiled, SCP-804 was able to produce a massive destructive force. 
one in which plenty of people were present to witness. The Foundation has uncovered a number of documents about World Without Man from the artist's website. When they stepped in to clear up what happened after SCP-804 was revealed, among those present when the piece was displayed were an audience of prominent environmental activists who were well known throughout the world for their efforts to alert people to the threats facing our environment, and would likely be the ones that the message of World Without Man would resonate with the most. Of course we doubt that the SCP Foundation is all that interested in the artistic value of SCP-804, or its message of protecting the environment for that matter. What happened next was probably more likely to be what caught their interest. From the moment it was activated, SCP-804's destructive properties were unleashed, and it is still unclear if this was intentional or not. Had the members of Inel Matpar Mashta planned to unfurl chaos at the revealing of their masterpiece? Or was World Without Man sabotaged by someone who disagreed with its deeper meaning? It is hard to say. The only thing that the Foundation knows for certain is that no one survived. Anyone present during the incident was killed where they stood, and those responsible for creating SCP-804 either went into hiding or perished themselves. When activated, the smaller globes within SCP-804's larger one began to rotate, causing the display of its destructive and anomalous properties. The sculpture itself causes any man-made devices or artifacts within a 100-meter radius to stop working. Everything from phones and tablets to clothing, plastic, buildings, and even synthetic chemical compounds will begin to deteriorate, decay, and even disintegrate. If something is more advanced than a sharpened stick of wood, SCP-804 can destroy it. The longer World Without Man remains active, the wider its area of effect, and the stronger its destructive power will be. However, its ability to destroy any man-made object is always strongest closer to the source, right next to the globe of the sculpture. Sounds pretty inconvenient to be subjected to losing your clothes and personal belongings if you stand too close, but still harmless, right? Wrong. SCP-804 also has an adverse, destructive effect on human beings. Tissue cells will also deteriorate in the same way if they are within the radius of World Without Man. However, this happens much slower than when the sculpture disintegrates man-made matter. People standing too close will be painfully and excruciatingly broken down cell by cell. A victim of SCP-804 will gradually lose body mass bit by bit until only their skeleton remains, but it does not stop there. The effects of the anomalous art piece will continue even after death, dissolving bone, organs, muscle, and marrow into their most basic atomic components until truly nothing remains. Interestingly, there are ways to survive an encounter with the anomalous effects of SCP-804. The first is to, well, not be a human being. Anything non-human, including all forms of animal and plant life, will be left unharmed by the sculpture. So if you can somehow think of a quick way to transform yourself into a bird or a hydrangea, you would manage to escape unscathed. In theory, at least. Speaking of escaping, though, even if you were caught in SCP-804's area of effect, there is a chance you could still survive if you got far enough away before your entire body was turned to dust. Though drastic, it is possible to recover from World Without Man's human tissue damage given the proper circumstances and volume of medical care. During the SCP Foundation's testing, those who have survived have suffered symptoms similar to those of extreme and prolonged starvation. Creating a sculpture that sends out a shockwave capable of destroying all man-made materials and any human beings within 100 meters of its source is certainly one hell of a way to get the deeper message of your artwork across. But that might have you thinking, if SCP-804 is a piece of art, and it was created by the members of an art collective, then isn't World Without Man also technically man-made? And you would be correct in thinking that. Through prolonged testing of the device, the SCP Foundation has determined that SCP-804 is not immune to its own destructive effects. Since its first activation, and over the course of the Foundation's rigorous examination of it, the sculpture's capabilities have become impaired. 
However, this does not make it any less dangerous. If someone was somehow able to repair SCP-804, perhaps reunited with the statue it was originally a part of, then the threat it would pose to the modern world would be astronomical. How bad would the damage be? Well, let's put it this way. If SCP-804 was able to remain fully active without suffering its own effects, then this anomalous artwork could easily wipe any and all traces of humanity from the face of planet Earth in a matter of weeks. You could be forgiven for thinking that destroying man-made artifacts and disintegrating human tissue was the worst that SCP-804 can do, but you would be wrong yet again. The Foundation's top researchers have theorized that World Without Man also possessed some form of mimetic effect, that SCP-804 is able to mentally influence people, possibly creating a compulsion among those who view it. However, they are still uncertain of this, and testing is currently focused on if this effect has also been weakened by SCP-804's gradual decay. But back to when this destructive piece of art was first discovered. Unelmet Paramashta Mailmashta had unveiled World Without Man at an art show in Alaska. Around five minutes after SCP-804 initially activated, a nearby remote town in northern Alaska was the first to feel the effects. The residents were panicked, calling for emergency services. After all, wouldn't you be afraid if you realized that you were starting to disintegrate, along with your home and all of your possessions? Unfortunately, the town was too remote of a location for anyone to properly respond. A single light aircraft was the first on the scene, and the pilot witnessed firsthand as the entire town was rapidly wiped out. By the time the Foundation heard about the situation and dispatched its agents to the location, there was nothing left. Not one home, nor any living person. SCP-804 had been active for almost eight straight hours, and the nearby Alaskan town had been wiped clean of any and all traces of human civilization. The Foundation's agents traced the epicenter of SCP-804's destructive effect back to where it had been unveiled, only to discover that survivors from the nearby town had gathered around what was left of the sculpture. Many of them were already suffering from hypothermia, as well as being severely affected by the device in other ways. Somehow, these survivors were being compelled to approach SCP-804 and push the globe within to reactivate its effect. If one died, another would step forward from the group to take their place. Those around the sculpture would cheer and encourage them to maintain the anomalous artwork, praising them for keeping it running despite what SCP-804 was doing to them. Under the orders of an O5 Council member, the Foundation's agents on site opened fire on the crowd, their bullets disintegrating from the statue's effect, but still managing to cause lethal wounds. As the globe stopped spinning, the effects of SCP-804 ended, and the agents were able to move in and secure the sculpture. Many of the survivors then opted to lie down in the snow, letting their injuries and the cold kill them. Any that were arrested by the Foundation refused to respond to questioning. Given that any Foundation facility would be man-made in nature, it was decided that SCP-804 would be best left where it was, allowing the Alaskan cold to freeze its machinery. A handful of Foundation guards were left on site as well, just in case anyone decided to come looking for World Without Man and try to reactivate the anomalous piece of art. Additionally, the Foundation wanted the remains of the device kept away from their facilities until they could figure out if or how it had compelled people to keep it active. Dr. Johannes Sorts of the SCP Foundation investigated the mimetic properties of SCP-804, and according to his findings, there is nothing especially virulent or dangerous about SCP-804's mimetic properties. Only a few select personality types have any desire to reactivate the device. We've been looking at this all wrong. There is no magical compulsion that could drive so many people to destroy themselves. There does not need to be. The artist and activist group Unelmat Paramashta Mailmashta had created a device capable of wiping out all traces of human life on Earth. It could turn buildings and people to dust, making any that were left keeping it spinning, no matter if it killed them. It was made to represent an ideal, the cure for the planet from the disease of humanity. But why would these activists unleash it on a town full of innocent people? If they knew this machine had the potential to wipe out all human life on Earth, why activate it? 
killing themselves too? The answer is simple. Because they wanted to. They intended to send a message. But the real question is, are we smart enough to listen to it? Help me! Would somebody please help me? I'm lost and I can't see! It echoed through the alley in a thin, reedy voice that suggested brittleness of body and spirit. Who wouldn't hear that cry and feel a pang of sympathy? Are you so heartless that you'd ignore the desperate pleas for help of a blind man clearly in distress? For all you know, he might even be in danger. What if he walks into a road and gets hit by a car? Would you really want that on your conscience? Questions like these were flying through the head of the Good Samaritan when he decided to go and investigate, when it seemed like everyone else was just content to pretend they didn't hear it and carry on with their day as normal. The Good Samaritan was a person not unlike yourself. They were also the kind of person we all hoped and wished we would be in a situation such as this. Kindness and generosity is a virtue, after all. The problem is there are people out there who know this and are willing to take advantage of that kindness and generosity. But even worse is the fact that there are things that are definitely not people out there willing to take advantage of human compassion too. But back to the Good Samaritan. He approached the sound of the distressed man in the alley. He looked old and frail, hunched over with the weight of his years. He wore thick, dark glasses, and his white cane was laying on the road a few feet away from him. It was a tragic scene, but thankfully the Good Samaritan was here to help. He approached the old man calmly, telling him that it would be okay. The Good Samaritan picked up the walking cane and passed it over to the blind old man. His face spread into a warm smile and he said, Thank you, thank you, thank you, young man. It warms my heart to know there are still good people like you on this earth. The old man told the Good Samaritan that he'd come into town to get some fresh air and a little exercise, at which point he'd gotten lost. When the Good Samaritan asked whether it was safe for him to come alone, the old man told him that he always used to go on walks with his wife, but ever since the accident, she didn't seem to want to be seen in public. The Good Samaritan naturally felt for the old man, who seemed as sweet as he was feeble. He offered to escort the old man back to his house personally, wanting to make sure that he returned home safely. The old man smiled and graciously accepted, saying that his wife would probably want to thank the kind young man for helping him in person. Of course, the Good Samaritan was so wrapped up in the warm glow of doing a good deed that he never once stopped to question the strangeness of this whole situation. He just walked along with the old man, listening to him tell his fanciful stories as they left the city center and crept further into the sleepy outskirts of their small Kentucky town. He was just rambling on as old men tend to do. He told the Good Samaritan a little more about his beloved wife. She was a kind woman who he'd known for as long as he could remember. His elementary school sweetheart, then his high school girlfriend, and not long after they graduated, his beautiful blushing bride. Oh yes, she'd always been the prettiest lady, until the accident. Curiosity was getting the better of him. The Good Samaritan couldn't help but ask what exactly the accident he kept alluding to was, and the old man was all too happy to give him an answer. Not that this answer was, in any way, pleasant. His wife had been trapped in a terrible fire in town that gave her severe burns all over her body. She was lucky to be alive, but the flames took her beauty and her confidence away from her. Since then, she'd become a real homebody, often refusing to leave the house and rarely ever letting strangers see her. The Good Samaritan's heart ached for this poor old couple. Why were such nice people often forced to endure so much suffering? Did this old man even have anyone else to talk to? They reached his house soon enough. It was the furthest one on the end of the street, right next to the darkness of the woods. It looked old and dilapidated, but it wasn't like the old blind man could even know that. As they were walking up the small set of stairs to the porch, the old man stumbled slightly, causing his thick, dark glasses to fall to the floor. The Good Samaritan reflexively leaned over to pick up the glasses for the old man. As he passed them back, he noticed something strange. The old man wasn't just blind, he literally didn't have any eyes. Just two black, empty sockets where his eyes should be. The Good Samaritan was just thankful that the old man wasn't able to see him staring as he put the glasses back on. The two of them entered the house, 
The Good Samaritan was too busy thinking about the old man's empty eye sockets to even notice him locking the door behind them, and by then, it was already too late for him. The old man called out into the dark expanse of the house. Sweetheart, I've got you a live one. Before the Good Samaritan could ask what he actually meant by that, the old man shuffled off, deftly navigating the halls through memory alone, and took one of the two seats at the dining table. He just sat there, smiling, waiting. That's when the Good Samaritan heard the creaking sound coming from above, something moving up in the darkness of the second floor, and then descending the stairs with heavy, clomping footsteps. When his eyes came into focus in the dark, he saw it there, the most terrifying thing he'd ever witnessed, coming down the stairs towards him. It was vaguely human in its shape alone, but in all other respects, it was a monster through and through. This gnarled, twisted creature with bulging eyes, dead flesh, and filthy, exposed fangs, like it stepped straight out of a nightmare and into the physical world where it did not belong. There looked to be a huge hole in its lower torso too, with no blood or organs inside, just an infinite blackness. The creature's lipless mouth twisted into a smile. The creature said something in a voice that the Good Samaritan couldn't understand. It was the black tongue, something ancient, terrifying, and unknown. As the creature got closer and closer, the Good Samaritan turned and made a run for the door. He tried to figure out the lock, his hands fumbling and uncoordinated by fear. He could hear the footsteps and the heavy breathing of that thing getting closer behind him. He was so close, almost there. That's when a strange black substance seemed to encase the world around him. It separated him from the door he was so nearly able to breach, locking him in. He was trapped inside what looked like a giant black sphere made of some unknown material or energy. He turned to see that monster standing right behind him, just grinning and waiting for the inevitability of the situation to sink in. The Good Samaritan had never been more terrified. Something else began to shift inside the sphere. A structure was growing out of the ground up and around him like a cage within a cage. He was trapped and huddled inside a strange conical structure as more figures entered the sphere around him. They were just like the first, this horrible horde of desiccated not people, all with grinning lipless mouths. When they closed in on him, the Good Samaritan had the one consolation that at least it was over, but it wasn't. Not yet. The blind old man waited in the kitchen for five hours as unmentionable horrors unfolded inside the black sphere. The Good Samaritan was actually lucky all in all, because for some sessions for victims inside the sphere had lasted as long as 27 hours. He screamed the entire time, with the sphere finally demanifesting just moments after the screaming stopped. Remaining was only one of the creatures, but no Good Samaritan. Just several neat piles of human organs arranged by organ type. Are you down in there, honey? The blind old man asked. I've been getting awfully hungry. The creature replied in perfect English. Yes, yeah. I think you have some supper before you go to bed. The creature picked up some of the discarded organs and took them into the kitchen, where it began cooking them into a stew for the old man. He ate the stew not long after, blissfully ignorant to its contents, and went to sleep. Whatever organs from the Good Samaritan weren't used in the stew were simply thrown into the fireplace to burn away into ashes. Later that night, the old man would die peacefully of a heart attack in his sleep at age 81. He spent the latter 10 years of his life in service of SCP-957. He'd never even had a wife, and when the monster first invaded his home, he wasn't even blind. He'd simply come home one day to find SCP-957 lurking in his home, waiting for him. As far as the SCP Foundation is aware, it always targets people who live alone. The man had tried to resist, but the creature was freakishly strong in spite of its wiry frame. It grabbed him and forced his body into the dark gaping chasm of its chest. He was swallowed up into another world on the other side of the void and returned four hours later, a changed man. His eyes were gone, and he now firmly believed that SCP-957 was his beloved, if burnt scarred, wife of many years. He'd do anything for her, even heading out into the world and feigning distress to lure people back into her terrible clutches. 
That's how the old man became SCP-957-1. He wasn't the first, and wouldn't be the last. With the old man now dead, SCP-957 would demanifest and head off in search of a new victim, invading their home and repeating the cycle once more somewhere else. The somewhat happy ending is that in one of these cases, the SCP Foundation somehow got wise to the baiting activities of SCP-957, and they were able to contain the creature, giving it the Keter object class for its frequent attempts to either get out or lure in new victims. It's never been actively hostile to Foundation researchers and guards, just a little obtuse. Despite the fact that it's perfectly capable of speaking fluent English, it prefers to speak in an unknown dead language for somewhat mysterious reasons. Very little is known about the origins or true nature of SCP-957, but our brief glimpse into its interior life does little to comfort us. In 2008, the Foundation recorded 957 having a conversation with an unseen individual in its native tongue. Foundation linguistic experts have been able to partially crack the code on what was being said that day. 957 asked the unseen figure how much longer it would have to stay here. The figure told it that it would need to wait there for a while, and that its disguise was extremely convincing. 957 complained that being here was boring and tiresome, but the unseen figure urged 957 to remain patient. It said, We have to let them watch the view, so that the many can move freely. We will be done without research soon enough. For as long as human beings have walked upon the earth and looked up to the night sky at the vast, inky darkness of space, we've pondered a particular question over and over again. Are we truly alone in the universe? Surely it can't just be us, right? The stars and planets stretch out so vastly beyond the confines of our little blue world. It seems that there's at least enough room up there for some other forms of life to exist. But if they do, if there's someone or something out there, would they be friend or foe? Would an alien race be sympathetic to the plights of humanity? Or would they perhaps view us as a hostile threat, something to be wiped out before we had a chance to do the same to them? How would such a race even go about introducing itself to us? With a swift attack, a grandiose emerging from space, or maybe they try something far subtler, a subterfuge, observing us from a distance, watching, learning, all while hidden in plain sight. To answer these questions posed throughout the ages, the ideas that have inspired generations of science fiction writers, perhaps we should turn our gaze away from the stars. Let's start our story by instead looking at something smaller, something that might be the exact opposite of the incalculable vastness of space and all the mysteries it holds. This story, like so many others, begins not up there among constellations, meteors, and gas giants, but in a small rural town, a satellite miles and miles away from the busy lifestyle of the nearest city, a place where everyone knows each other's face and where someone, no, something has been waiting, watching, concealed in the one place no one would expect. Now, it's worth remembering that when you live in a small town, being a local celebrity is essentially just the same as infamy. Saying that you're really famous in your hometown can be like admitting that you're considered the weirdest person in your direct vicinity. Sometimes the people with that mindset wind up strutting around their tiny township in the middle of nowhere under the impression that they're God's gift to every passerby. Other times, they garner odd looks and whispered stories from anyone that spots them. Gary knew more than his fair share of these types. He worked at a small family-owned convenience store, one of those places that everyone in town shopped at. Now, as any retail worker will tell you, no one who works in a shop ever really likes their job. Ultimately, it's usually just a way to get paid with the promise of one day being able to wave goodbye to the cycle of stacking shelves and manning the cash register. And so, trapped in a small-town retail job, usually stationed in the one spot where he had to talk to every customer that came through the door, Gary had seen them all. From the ordinary and boring to the nasty and unreasonable, but on the other side of that list were the people who were just a little bit off. 
Those customers might look a bit shady or act a bit strange, not enough to draw everyone's attention, but still enough to be noticed. Almost like they felt uncomfortable in their own skin. One of the more infamous customers that Gary had encountered had garnered one hell of a reputation with his fellow employees. They even had a nickname for her, the Duchess, as those working in the shop knew her. She seemed mostly oblivious to other people around her until she needed something, and her way of asking for help was certainly strange, to say the least. Sometimes she might be rude or talk without specifying which of the store's employees she was talking to, but then there were the times where she seemed to be trying to engage in conversation with Gary or one of his co-workers. The Duchess might start out speaking with most of her own patterns, but would seem to try to copy the cadence or dialect of whoever she happened to be talking to. She'd copy accents, echo back particular phrases, or even other languages like she was mocking them or trying to mimic them. Naturally, every time she appeared in the store, Gary and the rest of the staff ran a mile, or at least hid in the break room out back, until the owner of the store told them to all get back to work. But among the employees, caution was always advised when approaching or providing service to the Duchess, as if she could snap at a moment's notice. Whenever he saw her, Gary was reminded of his first encounter with this particular customer. He had been unlucky enough to be filling shelves when the Duchess had appeared out of nowhere. She forced a basket into his hands and instructed Gary to follow her around the shop and fill it with items that she specified. Afterward, she told him to carry her bags of shopping outside and fill her car before she left. It was as though someone had altered Gary's job description to butler without telling him. No one fully understood why she always acted so bizarrely. There were plenty of rumors circulating, of course, ranging from the simple explanation of she's from a different generation to the more outlandish and wild theories. While he'd never fully believed in things like that, Gary always joked that she was so disconnected because she was actually from another planet. Sure, an alien disguised as a human coming to do their grocery shopping at a small town store sounds impossible, right? Well, maybe. Around a week since his previous encounter with the Duchess, Gary noticed another customer in the store who seemed to be acting just as unusually. It was a man this time, wiry and tall, but hunched over. When the man had first come into the store, Gary had spotted him muttering to himself. Instantly, trapped once again behind the cash register, he felt his heart drop, immediately assuming the man might cause trouble. As he shuffled all around the store, slinking through the aisles, Gary could overhear him ranting about waffles? The wire-framed man was murmuring about waffles, how they were a pastry eaten for breakfast with syrup, how much humans enjoyed them. Humans. He hadn't said us. He had specifically used the word humans. The man quickly corrected himself with the proper word, almost as if he was teaching himself how to speak. Naturally, as anyone else working retail would, Gary assumed the man was inebriated. As was often the case, no matter how strange someone in the store was acting, the staff would ultimately forget all about them by the time their long eight-hour shift drew to a close and they were eventually allowed to go home. But maybe it was becoming more frequent, because for some reason, Gary couldn't help noticing even more weird behavior from people all over town. Sometimes it'd be somebody he knew, a neighbor, a dog walker, the one jogger he'd see on their way back from the park as he was heading home after work. One day they'd be themselves, the next day they'd be, well, alien. Every time he spotted one, it seemed that another would appear the very next day. Little did Gary know, things were only due to get even stranger still. Over the next month, staff from the store stopped showing up for their shifts. Gary's manager was in pieces, trying to call his employees to find out exactly why they weren't notifying him about their unscheduled absence. Each one never gave a clear answer. The more of them stayed home, the longer Gary found himself having to pick up the slack and cover their shifts. At first, when it was just an extra one or two shifts a week, he didn't mind so much. Working more hours meant extra pay. But as more and more of his colleagues seemed to disappear without a trace, Gary started finding himself spending more time at work than at home and feeling pretty unhappy about it, to say the least. 
After all, what good is all that extra overtime pay if you can't get any time to spend it? Just as Gary's exhaustion from having to work so much was reaching its peak, taking so much of a toll that he could barely stay awake at the checkout, that's when she appeared again. The Duchess looked different this time, though, and definitely not as the result of a dramatic makeover. Immediately, Gary noticed some kind of growth swelling out from the Duchess's shoulder. He didn't want to stare, that would be just as rude if not worse than making a comment about it, but he was certain it hadn't been there before. On this particular day, the Duchess had seemingly also decided to be more unreasonable than usual. Instead of just making Gary carry her groceries out to her car again, she was insisting that he bring them all the way back to her house. Naturally, Gary told her what any reasonable person would, explaining calmly that he couldn't leave the store during his shift, in the interest of putting his own safety first. Wrong move. The Duchess didn't seem to understand the concept, repeatedly stating that this was non-negotiable. Now, when someone in Gary's line of work is faced with an unreasonable and unusual request, the only person that can come to their aid is their manager. Unfortunately, a long debate with the Duchess was a battle that Gary's boss just couldn't win. Eventually, after talking in circles with the Duchess, the store owner folded, telling his employee to do as she asked while he stayed behind and watched the cash register. Begrudgingly, Gary picked up the Duchess's groceries as she led him out of the store. Big mistake. Although it wasn't far and Gary wasn't really listening, the strange customer seemed to be talking about a gathering she was hosting, with a group of local townsfolk waiting at her home. Sure, that sounds normal enough for some small-town folk, when there's limited number of people who live near you. Loving thy neighbor usually becomes your only option for socializing. But Gary wasn't expecting the sight that awaited him when he arrived at the Duchess's house. Just as she had said, there was a huge group of locals there, all of them milling around idly, staring at Gary with wide, unnerving eyes, not blinking as he carried the groceries indoors. As if that wasn't strange enough, almost all of them seemed to be sporting the same type of growth as the Duchess, bulging out of their shoulders or just visible under shirt collars. Just like back in the store, Gary tried to force himself not to stare, never letting his eyes linger for too long on one of the silent staring townsfolk or their strange protrusions. But maybe he would have been safer if he'd stared. Maybe he would have noticed the group of them huddling around him, shuffling closer while his back was turned. If he stared, he might have spotted the hands reaching out towards him, and he might even have seen what looked like his co-workers, the friends he had from the store, all huddled at the back of the room. As far as his boss knew, Gary returned within a few minutes, followed shortly by the rest of his staff. The store owner spent a few minutes angrily berating them for not showing up to work on time, not thinking to question where they'd all been or why they all came back to the store when Gary did. Each of his employees simply stood there, staring at him, hanging off every word, like it was the first time they heard a human being speak, or like they were learning how to. The truth was, neither Gary nor any of his colleagues made it back to the store that day. The things that came back in their place only looked like Gary and the others on the outside. Just like the other people in the town, more and more of them had been acting strange, speaking in odd patterns and sporting strange growths on their bodies. No one knows how long it took for everyone to be replaced. Some mysterious organization swept into town a few weeks later. A number of people, or the things that were disguised as people, all disappeared soon after. Any actual humans that were left behind didn't notice, forgetting how many others used to live in the town, as if they had been drugged. With the local store closing its doors and fewer people around, most of them packed their belongings and moved on, heading to live elsewhere. Eventually, the town fell silent. If you were to pass through there today, you'd find nothing but the remains of a community that gradually changed into something alien. All that's left of the place now is a ghost town. You might even call it an empty shell. Few people would ever really understand what happened in that small rural town. Even those who did know would never admit to it. The SCP Foundation is like that, as you may well know. They're shady, 
secretive, and would much rather keep to themselves. Not unlike that group of townsfolk, actually. Well, that is, after they'd each been replaced by an instance of SCP-3994. The thing no one dares to ask about humanity looking up to the stars for so many centuries is what if someone up there was looking back at us? What if, for the entire lifetime of our civilization, there's been a race of alien creatures attempting to study us, venturing to our backwater small town of a planet and taking the form of humans for some nefarious purpose? Meet SCP-3994. That is, if you haven't already been acquainted with one of them, they could be anyone. The local celebrity in your small town, a person who you pass on the street every day, even a wild animal. You see, SCP-3994 refers to a race of extraterrestrials, beings not of our world, and a currently unknown number of them have been catalogued by the SCP Foundation. SCP-3994s tend to hide in plain sight through the use of convincing human skin disguises, or shells. Well, while these shells might start by looking convincing, in actual fact, they're far from perfect. Almost 70% of SCP-3994 shells experience some form of rapid degradation, and this causes the imperfections in their disguises to shine through. A deteriorating human shell usually results in a number of physical deformities. An SCP-3994 instance wearing its shell might appear as someone with a limb that twists and bends in an unnatural way, but showing no signs of actually noticing it. Alternatively, a person who seems to have a skeleton that doesn't match their external bodily proportions might also be an extraterrestrial in hiding. And then, there's the growths that some SCP-3994 shells have. These are severe malformations that resemble elephantiasis, a medical condition that causes certain areas of the body to enlarge. But just looking out for these tells isn't a surefire way of spotting one of these aliens. Not all their shells have the same levels of decay. In fact, the Foundation has developed subcategories of SCP-3994 instances based on how noticeable their shells are. Category A are SCP-3994s whose shells are almost impossible to detect, practically resembling human beings one-to-one. -one. On the other side are the Category Cs, which are members of the same extraterrestrial species without shells. And between them, in Category B, are the ones whose shells are showing signs of decay. Another method the SCP Foundation has used to detect instances of SCP-3994 is speech. In almost 40% of conversations, these aliens will attempt to mimic the speech patterns of the human they are conversing with. This can be as blatant as SCP-3994 is echoing back elements of speech as hard to replicate as regional accents and dialects, different languages, or specific phrases unique to the person they're copying. While in some instances, SCP-3994s have shown difficulty with grammar and syntax at first, they seem to be quick learners. Couple that with almost perfect shells in Category A, and these alien visitors could prove to be formidable infiltrators. Researchers even discovered telepathic communications between instances. Eventually, though, all SCP-3994 shells do inevitably decay. This usually takes around a year, as their human disguises gradually dissolve until the creature beneath is eventually exposed. That's where the various protrusions, misshapen body parts, and other signs of decay come from. It's not that SCP-3994s are intentionally walking around with noticeable shells, it's that they can't prevent their shells from eventually withering away until their true self is put on display. And what do they look like under their disguises? Are they tall, slender, gray-skinned beings with long heads? Are they tiny little green men piloting human-sized robot suits? Could they even be bulbous creatures of living calcium with huge claws kept concealed and compressed in skin suits with zippers hidden under their hairlines? Well, no to all of these. That'd be terribly cliché, don't you think? Beneath their rapidly decaying shells is a viscous pulp-like substance of formless and unquantifiable composition. Without their disguises, SCP-3994 have no regular shape, no skeleton or body structure. Underneath, each of them is just an indeterminate mass that drags itself around aimlessly. So the one question that remains is, why? 
Why come to Earth? Why replicate and replace innocent humans? Why spend so much time trying to learn how to blend in as part of a civilization like sinister imposters among us? Well, the ones in Foundation captivity seem to be pretty eager to leave. During multiple incidents, they have been known to create shells that mimic the appearance of security staff, scientists, and other Foundation personnel in order to orchestrate their escape. All the while, they've been showing themselves capable of learning how to impersonate human speech and mannerisms. But what is it all for? The best answer is, we don't know. Or rather, we don't know yet. Could they be here to study humanity? Do these SCP-3994s want to learn how to be more like us for their own benefit? Think about it. If you had no shape, no body, if you were just a formless mass, wouldn't you feel a little lonely? SCP-3994s, like humans, might be social animals. The difference is we can hug each other, high-five each other, converse, form meaningful connections through talking and touch. It could be that's where these extraterrestrial imposters want, why they decided to venture across the stars to live among us. That'd be nice, right? But then there's the other explanation. SCP-3994 are an alien army hiding out on Earth, learning more and more about us, day by day. The more they learn, the better they'll get at copying us, walking, talking, and acting no different from any other human. The Foundation doesn't even know just how many are out there. Soon they could have perfectly mimicked every language, every culture, every person on Earth. And what happens then? What happens when we all get replaced? Well, at that point, the planet would no longer belong to us. It would be the new home for SCP-3994. It has been often said that dog is man's best friend. And obviously, that isn't just exclusive to men. Ask any pet owner, whether they own a dog, cat, rabbit, hamster, or soul-sucking interdimensional parasitic monster with too many tentacles, and they'll all tell you the same. Your pet can be your best friend. They can give you the most unconditional, affectionate form of love possible. And as long as you treat your little buddy right, they'll be loyal to you for the rest of your life and theirs. It's not uncommon for a pet to outlive their owner, especially if they belong to someone who's elderly. And that might be a sad thing to think about for some. Although it is important to remember the positives, like how much happiness and companionship that animal would have brought an aging owner in their last years of life. Even someone younger who dies unexpectedly might have had their quality of life infinitely improved by owning a loving pet to make them smile. But on the other hand, there's the negative downside that now some pets have to live on after a tragic death, not fully understanding where their beloved owner went. So often we hear stories of dogs that waited for their master to come home, only for them to never walk through the front door again. And it's equally hard when things pan out the opposite way, and an owner loses their pet. The one silver lining is that we, as human beings, have a far greater understanding of death and the grief it causes. We know that eventually, despite how hard it can be to adjust to that initial heartbreaking loss, it is possible to move on and for things to one day get better. But what happens when someone can't accept the death of their beloved animal companion? When the unconditional love of their pet is suddenly missing from their life, how far will a person go to recapture that feeling? How long does it take for grief born out of love to become an unhealthy fixation? And what is the true price of obsession? Well, the answer involves SCP-589, both what it can give and just as easily take away. For as long as she could remember, and even further back than that, Erin and her dog Poncho had been inseparable. Ever since her mom had first adopted that scrappy little Jack Russell Terrier, Erin had fallen head over heels in love with that little rascal. Loving a pet is different from loving another person, because they just can't help showing how much they love you back. Humans, for all their good qualities, are so nuanced and not everyone is honest with each other all of the time. But a pet, especially a dog, even though they can't speak, a bark or a whimper or excited wagging of a tail can easily tell you how they're feeling. And Poncho was no exception. Erin and her mom Cleo lived alone. It was just the two of them for quite a long time. 
and while Cleo had little problem with that, she couldn't help but notice how isolating it was for her daughter. From a young age, Erin had always been quiet, kept to herself at school. Her mom kept expecting her to make some friends, asked to invite them over or vice versa, but it didn't seem to be happening. It didn't seem to be bothering her daughter, but Cleo was worried that it was giving her the wrong idea, that being on her own was somehow better. So, in an effort to give Erin at least one source of companionship, Poncho joined the family. Brown patches dotted over his white fur. He was the perfect pet, an excitable and loving little puppy that Erin was immediately smitten with. When Cleo told her he was hers to keep, being only seven years old, Erin broke down crying with tears of joy. Her mom had let her pick out a name for him, and she'd quickly settled on Poncho. At first, Erin had meant to say it differently, in order to name the pup after a friendly character from her favorite animated movie, but had mispronounced it in her excitement at meeting the energetic dog for the first time. The name quickly stuck, though, and as the years went on and Poncho got bigger, Erin bought her four-legged best friend a little poncho of his own to wear when it started raining. Over the following years, Poncho became Erin's most constant and loving companion. Even as she grew up, moving through her childhood, and found making friends a little easier with every passing year, there never came a time when she didn't need her best friend. When Erin had her first breakup in high school and came home with floods of tears in her eyes, Poncho could sense she was upset and came wandering up to her, sitting in her lap to make her feel just a little bit better. Then a few years later, when her mom got sick, Erin had to take care of her, a task that would have been much harder without Poncho there to alleviate that stress and lift her and Cleo's spirits. And when Cleo eventually passed, the little white and brown dog sat quietly with his owner as she said goodbye to her mom. Now that it was just the two of them, Aaron and Poncho were living in a tiny apartment. It was cramped for one person and a dog, but Aaron was just grateful to have a place to live in the company of her favorite pup. Besides, Poncho wasn't a puppy anymore. In fact, he hadn't raced around the park or chased a ball for quite a long time. With the numerous stresses of her everyday life, Least of all, holding down two jobs in her desperate attempts to make enough money to pay rent, Aaron had hardly noticed the signs. Poncho was showing his age. It had been happening gradually in the background over the years. He wouldn't chase the ball or really move around much, and when he did, it was little more than a lethargic plod around the apartment. Perhaps it was because of such a measured, slower-paced change that Aaron was unable to acknowledge it. She could see her old friend was getting more tired, sleeping longer his tail rarely wagging as much as it used to, but by now that felt like Poncho's normal behavior. Then again, given how important her dog was to her, it's just as likely she didn't want to accept the truth that unfortunately, nothing lasts forever. He was almost 15 in human years, which by all accounts is an impressive age for a dog, especially one of Poncho's size and breed. It was on a day that Aaron was out working her morning job, when it happened, the faithful, adoring Jack Russell Terrier, who had spent his years being nothing but loved and giving back only more love in return, curled up on Aaron's bed. The apartment was still, silent, not a sound to be heard, save for those last, tired few breaths. Laying there, maybe the dog wondered if he'd ever get to see his friend again, if she would make it back from work in time. He closed his little brown eyes and peacefully drifted off for one last sleep. During the break between her shifts, after the end of the one at her first job and before starting her second, Erin had just enough time to get home. Usually, she had just had enough time to eat and get herself ready for the changeover, then quickly check on Poncho before having to dash back out. Poking her head into the bedroom, she saw her dog laying right there on her bed. There was a stillness to him that instantly made her stomach drop. His ears didn't move when she called his name. He didn't react when she stroked his fur. He was gone. And the moment she realized it, Erin felt like her whole world had come crashing down. The loss of her oldest and closest friend hurt almost as much as losing her mom. Erin always felt that the problem with funerals wasn't just how sad they were, or how it always seemed to rain when she went to one. Instead, it was more that they could never properly sum up just how much someone truly meant. Nobody could ever condense the year's worth of love and memories into a burial, and it was worse when losing a pet. There was no procession, no wake, nobody else there, just her and Poncho, saying goodbye a final time. Eventually things got to be too much. 
The heartbreak of Pancho's death was another struggle in a lifetime of lows that had all left their lasting wounds on Aaron. That, coupled with the stress of trying to carry on with a busy life, barely able to keep herself afloat in either of her jobs, had pushed her to the edge of a breakdown. Maybe that's what summoned it. Perhaps something had sensed all of Aaron's mental anguish and had come to seek her out. It might have been that her wishes for something, some little alleviation to all the pain and stress were finally being granted. Or maybe it was just a gift left by her neighbor. The sun had long since set when Aaron arrived back at her apartment, stepping over the envelopes that littered her doormat, a few with words like overdue and urgent notice printed on them in red ink. Passing through the hallway, Aaron paused as she always did, hoping to hear the gentle pattering of paws against the floor. Her therapist had dissuaded her from doing that, saying it would only make moving on from losing Poncho worse. She didn't care. She wanted her dog back. And opening the door to her bedroom, it seemed like someone had been listening. Sat on her bed was a stuffed animal right in the spot where she'd found her little friend on that horrible day. It had been made to look like a dog, specifically resembling a Jack Russell Terrier, with brown patches over its white fur. The plushie was even wearing a little rain poncho. The sight of it was enough to cause Aaron to break down in tears, weeping in heavy sobs as she dashed across the bedroom to hold it in her arms. Hugging it tightly, her tears seeped into the soft fur as she felt it against her face. She didn't even think to question where it had even come from. All she wanted to do in that moment was hold the stuffed animal close. For the first time in what felt like years, a feeling of relief washed over Aaron. It was as if everything was melting away. The stress of work and the toll of her tiring shifts gone. All the pain from losing Cleo and Poncho dissipated too. In fact, it felt like she now had her beloved dog back. No, it was better than that. It was almost as though everything about Poncho, his energy, his spirit, the way he made her feel so calm and loved was all distilled into this stuffed animal. And now, it would never grow old, never age and die, causing her more pain. Erin gripped the soft toy tightly. The longer she held the hug for, the more her stress and sadness faded. Her face was still wet with tears. Although her sobbing had gradually become low, gentle chuckles soon giving way to a peal of uncontrollable laughter rising in volume. It was as though she had taken something, and the very chemistry of her brain was being altered. But after so much hardship, it felt good, to the point where she was almost lightheaded, laying down on the floor of her bedroom, arms locked around the plushie that reminded her so much of Poncho. Erin continued softly giggling to herself. Her entire body relaxed, so much so that every part of her felt like warm butter, as if she was about to start melting through the floorboards. Although she didn't know it, or probably wouldn't have even cared, her dopamine levels were spiking, flooding her with the bodily hormone that relieves stress and makes a person feel good. In fact, right now, she was feeling better than she ever had. Every day that followed, Erin would come home to her stuffed animal, her poncho too, as she liked to think of it. It didn't bother her how childlike anyone else might find it for a grown woman to rely so heavily on a plushie for comfort. At any rate, it wasn't something she was advertising to anyone else. After every shift at both of her jobs, she'd race back to her apartment, right to Poncho 2, and just sit there, just basking in the way it made her feel. It was the most all-encompassing sense of euphoria and relief, reducing her stress so much that she felt like she was floating, her body lighter than air. That feeling was all that mattered to her. Some days she wouldn't even eat. Poncho too was more important to her than food. Gradually, she started to become addicted to that feeling. Having to wait until the end of her work shifts to feel that rush of happy chemicals flood her brain was too long of a delay. She started to crave it while working, unable to focus, feeling erratic and restless without Poncho too. Of course, she couldn't risk bringing it to work with her. What if someone took it, or she dropped it? Her boss might see her with a stuffed animal at her desk and fire her on the spot, or think that she was absolutely crazy. The only safe place for her source of relief was at home, but Erin knew she needed something to bridge the gap while she was working. The only substitute that worked was taking a photo of Poncho 2 on her phone, then blowing it up and printing off a copy. Erin could carry it around portably, keeping it in her pocket and taking it out to look at it every few minutes while she worked. The hit of positive chemicals it gave her wasn't quite as strong as getting to hold her stuffed animal, 
After all, it was just a grainy photo from her phone, essentially acting like a patch to tide her over until she could get back home to the real thing. However, it didn't take long for Aaron to start taking Poncho with her anywhere that wasn't work, to the grocery store, to visit her mom and her dog, and, of course, to therapy. I'm rather concerned about this pattern of behavior. Aaron's psychotherapist Dr. Lee stated when her patient explained what had been happening. Sitting across on the opposite side of her office on a leather couch, Aaron had Poncho too pressed tightly against her. I don't care, she sighed, her brain already awash with hormones that kept her calm. I like how it makes me feel, so I don't care. Aaron, look at yourself, Dr. Lee urged. You aren't properly dealing with your grief. It seems to me you're channeling all your desire for positive emotion into this stuffed animal. Poncho too. Aaron corrected her without taking her eyes off the soft brown and white dog and its little cloak. Listen to me, the therapist insisted, trying desperately to get through to her. Poncho, your dog, your real dog, is gone. You lost him six months ago. And your mom, Cleo, she passed away too. You have to process and come to terms with those things, as sad as they might make you feel. That's how we move on. But what you're doing right now isn't healthy, Aaron. It's becoming an obsession. Turning away, Aaron pressed Poncho 2 up against her face. I don't care, she repeated. By now, Aaron had become fully dependent on Poncho 2, showing up late for both jobs just so she could spend longer feeling those endorphins and hormones that hugging the stuffed animal seemed to bring. It didn't take long for her to start skipping entire shifts for days at a time and canceling any and all other plans just to sit at home basking in the relief brought on by her apparent obsession. Her apartment became a mess, untidied piles of mail by the front door, the walls plastered with hundreds of photos of her stuffed animal, fueling her obsession. Her evening job was the first to fire Aaron, citing her recent absences as the grounds for her dismissal. Even then, she still didn't seem to care. The fact she might not be able to make rent barely registered. Returning home after her other job called her in to tell Aaron she would no longer be working there either, she instantly looked around for Poncho too but it was nowhere to be found. All the photos on the walls having faded, Aaron checked her phone. All the original copies of the pictures were gone too. Instantly racked with fear, so addicted to the plushie that she could barely function without it, she began tearing her apartment to shreds looking for it. She wrenched cupboards off their hinges and tipped over her refrigerator. Flipping her mattress, Aaron sliced the fabric open with a kitchen knife, searching high and low for Poncho too, but unable to find it anywhere. She became frantic, erratic, pulling her hair out in a fit of uncontrollable despair. Where had it gone? Had someone stolen it? Dr. Lee. The paranoia had already set in, convincing Aaron that her therapist must have taken Poncho too. She was the only other person who knew about it, and had been so critical of her using it to make herself feel better. Marching into Dr. Lee's office utterly enraged beyond reason, all Aaron could think about was getting her stuffed animal back, no matter what she had to do. The effect it had on her was so powerful, so potent, and addictive, that living without it was worth anything, even another person's life. Little did Aaron realize, as her hands grew wetter, coated with more of Dr. Lee's blood after every bludgeoning strike, her therapist had no idea where Poncho too was. In fact, she had nothing to do with it vanishing in the first place. It had disappeared all on its own along with all the photograph copies Aaron had printed. Arriving somewhere miles away, SCP-589 was ready to begin the whole cycle again on its next victim. It would take on whatever shape it needed to appease the desires of the very next person to find it, preying on their vulnerability and making them totally dependent on it. That was what it did. Everywhere it went, leeching off people that it could easily manipulate. Its presence and interaction would calm SCP-589's victims, helping to alleviate their stress or make them feel better about their deepest insecurities. Before long, these helpless victims would be able to think of nothing else, feeling as if they were unable to live without their obsession doll. And every time, that was when SCP-589 would make its cruelest move. It would vanish, leaving its prey in a state of intense withdrawal. With the calming influence of SCP-589 absent from their lives all of a sudden, the infected people would suffer from a variety of potential psychological symptoms, manic depression, psychosis, uncontrollable despair, dementia, or in Aaron's case, 
paranoia, and a heightened sense of aggression that caused her to murder Dr. Lee. That was one of the earliest in a spate of similar incidents that had been reported, as SCP-589 traveled from town to town, its influence spread, leaving entire populations dead in its wake. All the while, the stuffed animal fed on the mental anguish that it caused its victims, making them pay the ultimate price for their obsession. Violent chaos unfolds across the shoreline. Huge fleshy tendrils slither out of the water, grabbing people who try to flee and drag them into the depths. As giant harpoons made of bone whiz across the beach, cutting down unfortunate sunbathers in droves. It is a terrifying massacre, but you'd never in a million years be able to guess its source. On April 10th, 2010, something strange began to happen in the Three Portlands. Now, the anomalous extra-dimensional city-state that overlaps with the locations of Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, and the Isle of Portland is no stranger to unusual occurrences. So it took the population a little while to notice that something was happening. But for some unknown reason, sailboats and motorboats were beginning to vanish from the city. The disappearances occurred overnight, when there was no one around to witness them, but slowly, the citizens began to notice that their friends and family members were going out in their watercrafts and never returning home. By April 15th, the civilians were becoming noticeably concerned, fearing the worst. On April 16th, their worst fears were confirmed when two local ghosts, Ankar Ahmed and Greg Moore, went for a nighttime stroll along the harbor. They heard a sudden commotion and rushed to the scene of the disturbance. They arrived just in time to see a living individual being dragged into the watery depths by a large, vein-like tendril. Ahmed asked Greg to wait on land while he ventured out into the water to look for the victim. Unfortunately, Ahmed never came back, and Greg took his story to the Three Portlands Police Department. After waiting a few days for the local man-eating clam populace to migrate, the FBI Unusual Incidents Unit mounted a formal investigation. On the morning of April 17th, all of the missing vehicles suddenly reappeared. This left the UIU and the people of the city with even more questions. Where had all the boats gone? Why were they suddenly back? And what had happened to the missing people who had not been returned along with them? On April 19th, UIU agents dove into the harbor to search for any unusual activity, and while they didn't spot anything especially strange, they did discover that there were fewer animals in the harbor than usual. On April 21st, the threat that had been preying on the citizens of Three Portlands actually made itself known. At 11.19 a.m., 17 boats moved away from the docks on their own, drifting up onto shore, though no one could be seen captaining any of them. As the boats lined up, they began to form a wall blocking access to the water. No one could get in or out. Civilians watched in shock as the boats began to warp and change before their eyes, growing thick masses of scales on their surfaces, sprouting harpoon guns that fired bony projectiles, and slashing veiny tendrils at anyone within reach. The citizens began to panic running in every direction in an attempt to escape the monstrous boats. But they were too slow to evade the attacks, and the boats snatched them off of the shore and yanked them aboard, using their harpoons to impale those who managed to run farther than the tendrils could stretch. As the army of fleshy boats closed in around the shore, a tugboat broke through the surface of the water. Unlike the rest of the boats, it had a noticeable hole in its hull and was missing its wheelhouse. At an unnaturally quick pace, the tugboat began to advance onto land, using its tendrils to drag itself along the shore and into the more populous part of town. It grabbed civilians at random, absorbing their blood into its metallic surface as it went. Suddenly, it spotted Albert Izat, a noted member of the Church of the Broken God, and began to focus its attack on him. But before the tugboat monster could reach Izat, a city security golem interfered. Sadly, though the golem put up a valiant fight, the anomaly was able to destroy it by falling onto it again and again until the golem was no longer able to get back up. There are few creatures that would survive having a boat drop itself on top of them repeatedly, and sadly, the security golem was not one of them. With the golem out of the way, the boat continued to drag itself through the streets wildly, crashing through the side of a local restaurant where its owner, an entity known as The Gruel, was in the middle of a busy brunch service. 
At the sight of the invading watercraft, the gruel set down his pitcher of bottomless mimosas, wiped his hands on his apron, and grabbed his trusty dual-wield swords from underneath the counter. He kept them there in case someone attempted to dine and dash, but he figured they would do just fine against a blood-drinking tugboat. While the gruel kept the tugboat busy, UIU forces were able to break through the barricade of boats for a brief period of time, allowing more security golems to enter the area, as well as allowing more citizens to escape. Unfortunately, this little victory was short-lived as further unforeseen horrors drudged themselves up from the deep. The reanimated corpses of various species native to the harbor began to crawl out of the water, surrounding the gruel and allowing the tugboat to escape the fight. As it made its way back to the harbor, every boat it passed attempted to toss bodies onto the tugboat, covering it in fresh blood. Slowly but surely, the damage to the tugboat began to repair itself. Once the boat had regained its strength, it set its sights on a previously untouched cargo ship. An observing UIU officer determined that the boat was somehow attempting to convert the cargo ship to transform it into another one of its fleshy allies. But before the transformation could take place, a cargo crate broke open, spilling over 1,000 hardtack crackers. Suddenly, the tugboat stopped everything that it was doing. It took one tendril and began to count each individual cracker that had spilled out. While the tugboat was distracted with its task, a citizen offered the UIU use of their Rare Metals Cannonball collection in the fight to apprehend the aggressive boat. One particular cannonball, made from Electrum, was able to puncture the hull of one of the infected ships, rendering it motionless. They were elated to have found a weapon that worked against these boats. While the tugboat continued to count, the remaining townspeople gathered all of the Electrum they could find and began to fight back against the boats. One by one, the boats sank, and all the while the tugboat continued to count. In the meantime, UIU officers managed to free the gruel from his zombie attackers. They presented him with an Electrum cannonball, which he proceeded to punch finger holes into and wield like a bowling ball. Then the gruel had a score to settle. No one, whether human, ghost, or tugboat, was going to mess with his brunch. The gruel barreled towards the harbor, grabbed hold of the still distracted tugboat, and punched it hard with his cannonball fist. If the tugboat could breathe, the punch would have knocked the air out of its lungs. The gruel then threw the tugboat out of the water and continued the savage beating, before preparing to destroy the battered vehicle once and for all. He lifted it up into the air, jumped up to follow it, and hit it with so much force that the tugboat careened through the air, colliding with a portal that had transported it to the Isle of Portland. Luckily, this portal could only be unlocked via a high-speed impact from a water-based vehicle. Speaking of luck, an SCP Foundation team was returning to the Isle from a failed mission just as the anomalous boat appeared in their reality. The object was knocked unconscious by the impact of its travel and the beating from the gruel, and in its incapacitated state, it was transported to a nearby Foundation site. There it was contained and given the designation of SCP-6426. Due to its anomalous traits, including the consumption of blood, a talent for hypnosis, and a compulsive counting habit, it was also given the nickname, The Vampire Boat. SCP-6426 is a Keter-class sapient hostile entity that, in an inactive state, bears the appearance of a harbor tugboat in a constant state of rust and degradation. Any blood, or organs containing blood, that come into contact with the boat will be absorbed through the metal, causing the degradation to visibly improve as a result. The most effective blood appears to come from humans, cetaceans, and a few specific species of salations. The entity does not only use the absorbed blood to improve its appearance, but is also capable of using it to create organic additions to its body, including the vein-like tendrils spotted in the three Portlands, cognitohazardous eyes attached to bending eye stalks, harpoon guns, and cannons capable of firing ammunition made from anomalous species of barnacles. These barnacles are capable of reanimating dead tissue on contact, and SCP-6426 frequently uses them to create instances of SCP-6426-C, masses of reanimated tissue that the boat uses to aid in its attacks or self-defense. SCP-6426 uses its tendrils to grab prey and drag them towards itself, but the tendrils serve an additional purpose as well. Each of the tendrils has a mouth on the tip, 
similar in structure to that of the North American medicinal leech. When the tendril has made contact with its prey, the mouth will then bite into the spinal column of the creature, causing its brain function to cease as its canines grow long and hollow. Hard scales form on their skin, and their muscle mass and bone density increase. Once they have been transformed in this way, organisms taken by SCP-6426 are designated SCP-6426-A. These instances are used to the entity's advantage, helping it to extract blood from victims at a distance, as well as providing an additional line of defense and offense. In the event that SCP-6426 encounters another watercraft, it is able to use SCP-6426-A to convert the vehicle into an instance of SCP-6426-B. These converted boats are similar to SCP-6426 and are able to function on their own. However, they are unable to produce their own eye stalks or cannons, unable to create SCP-6426-A instances, and do not appear to be as intelligent as their creator. In the early days of its containment, the exact nature of the anomaly's intelligence was the subject of debate amongst the research staff. However, on one specific occasion, the Foundation was able to establish a line of direct communication with SCP-6426 and conduct the first, and so far the only, interview with the vampiric tugboat. The inciting incident occurred when the arrival of the Foundation's latest hardtack shipment was delayed, leaving the boat with nothing to count and nothing to keep it occupied. Freed from the bounds of counting, it managed to escape and grab hold of several Foundation staff members with its tendrils. After chasing the boat through the site, guards were able to corner it, prompting the boat to absorb the bodies it had taken and use the organic material to produce a siren that emitted the sound of a human voice. It is through this siren that SCP-6426 responded to interview questions, using the voice of one of its victims. Junior researcher Sajad Williamson, in spite of his protests, was selected to conduct the interview. His fellow staff members refused to take no for an answer, and as the newest hire, the unpleasant job fell on his shoulders. Much to everyone's surprise, the anomaly began the conversation rather politely, saying, I am so sorry. I thought you were those self-righteous lunatics from the church. I apologize profusely for any trouble I may have caused, and I want to point out I fully support your mission. Yes, our first line of defense against the undersea menace. I am more than willing to punch sharks. Salations, yes, right. <laughs> How rude of me, yes. Dr. Williamson's first question concerned SCP-6426 apparent intended victim back in Three Portlands, Albert Izzat. SCP-6426 responded, Albert? His first name is really Albert. <laughs> well, what other relationship is there to say besides the hunter and the hunted? Admiral Izzat is a ruthless man, known for terrorizing and slaughtering people like me. He was leading a search party of those barbaric nautophiles, intending to gut me like a seal. What do you mean, people like you? Dr. Williamson inquired. Free thinkers, of course. People who are unafraid to break from the mold to carve their own path in life instead of following the predetermined route set by that ignorant check valve. The church is built upon a foundation of lies. No one's really a petty officer on this ship. We're all just cabin boys stumbling around in the dark as we follow the commands of an offhand COB. <laughs> If you want real power, real freedom, all you have to do is listen for the call of the beast. Open the portal, and he'll squeeze you right through. <laughs> Dr. Williamson, feeling rather in over his head, attempted to convince one of his colleagues to take over. When he refused, however, Dr. Williamson continued, um, <clears throat> Could you explicate your activities within the harbor and how you arrived there? Well, after I got the Botswans off my trail, I found a cave to hide in. I was forced to hide in, yes, forced to hide deep in the cave, which turned out to be a tunnel. Surprisingly, the tunnel led to some coastal community where I took refuge, licking my wounds in the safety of the depths as those zealots stalked the surface. I spent my time preparing, gathering the strength necessary to face them once more, until I was ambushed assaulted within my hideout by a Botswain. 
I fought for my life as I was forced out into the open and descended upon by a manner of monsters and freaks of this orchestrated by that scumbag Izzard. I was beaten within an inch of my life before. I'm not quite sure what happened after that. I believe I was knocked unconscious. You'll have to illuminate me on how I came to be in your custody. At this point, the interview began to veer in an odd direction. The boat expressed confusion about the nature of Williamson's questions, specifically how little they related to the subject of sharks and punching them. It was at this point that the site director sought guidance from the Multi-U department. A researcher there informed Williamson about the confusion. SCP-6426 had mistaken the SCP Foundation for another organization, the Shark Punching Center. Dr. Williamson resumed the interview, prepared to play along and keep the boat comfortable. Unfortunately, Williamson was a terrible liar. Yes, we are the Shark Punching Center. We will determine if you are a suitable candidate to carry out the mission to search, punch, and contain sh <clears throat> I mean salations. This verbal misstep caused SCP-6426 to become suspicious. After a moment, it pieced together the truth and began to throw itself against the wall in a desperate attempt to escape. It was apprehended by security guards, who impaled it with a naval ram and returned the watercraft to its containment cell. The exact reason for its apparent fear and hatred of the Foundation is currently unknown, and the boat has made no attempt to speak since. Currently, SCP-6426 is kept in a 39 meter by 39 meter by 50 meter containment chamber. Beneath the chamber, there is an artificial lava tube. The tugboat has a naval ram through its hull and engine, holding it in place. This ram is checked daily for signs of degradation, as it is the primary force keeping the anomaly immobile. If the ram is ever removed or damaged somehow, a failsafe system will activate, releasing 100 hardtack crackers and two pieces of electrum into the containment chamber. This is intended to keep the tugboat occupied until the naval rod can be replaced. If for some reason the naval rod fails and the boat runs out of hardtack to count, well, there will be nowhere on water or land that we can hide. Rock, paper, scissors. A simple hand game dating back to the Han Dynasty of Imperial China. It is a decisive game between two players, with the only outcomes being win, lose, or draw. We're quite familiar with rock, paper, scissors here at the SCP Foundation, as the guards are often seen playing intense rounds of the game to determine who will be the unlucky soul chosen to secure one of the various Keter class SCPs during a given week. In most cases, this use of rock, paper, scissors is accepted as a largely harmless and fair way for defensive personnel to arrange their shifts. The reason for this is that the results of rock, paper, scissors are generally random, as there are very few ways for an individual's skill to influence the game. Or so one might think. In reality, rock, paper, scissors is a deeply psychological game, and this is mainly because of its origin as a contest between fellow human beings. The average human is vulnerable to making errors and falling into patterns, and with only three options to keep track of, it is entirely possible for a seasoned veteran of rock, paper, scissors to predict their opponent's choice before any hands are thrown. Of course, that opponent may also commit an error of their own by misreading the other player's actions, and thus there is always a chance for an impulsive decision to swing the results of the game in either direction. Human limitation is the only skill-based mechanic in the game of rock, paper, scissors, and that same limitation is what, in the eyes of some, holds the game back from reaching its true potential. That was the case until someone out there discovered the rules to an anomalous version of rock, paper, scissors being spread through a mysterious email. While all attempts to trace the email back to its original sender have left the Foundation with more questions than answers, we have been able to learn more about the differences between the rules of standard rock, paper, scissors and the anomalous version. We have given this anomalous version of rock, paper, scissors the designation SCP-4633, and unlike the classic edition, under no circumstances are any Foundation personnel allowed to play a game incorporating any of the alternative rules. While the ceiling for skill and variety is theoretically much higher in a rock, paper, scissors match featuring SCP-4633, the risks to the player far outweigh any added novelty. Here is how SCP-4633 functions during an average game of rock, paper, scissors. Well, average prior to the anomalous properties taking effect. Rather than being limited to using merely rock, paper, or scissors, 
As the name of the game implies, the players gain access to a series of additional hand gestures, which upon the act of being thrown become seamlessly integrated into both players' shared understanding of the rules. This alone would be bizarre enough, but the true harm caused by SCP-4633 is in the nature of the gestures themselves. When one of the non-standard gestures allowed by SCP-4633 is used, the player's hands will change shape in ways that, under normal circumstances, would be anatomically impossible. Each of these non-standard gestures is distinct from the rest, with the only commonality being an unusual tendency for the final gesture to resemble biological structures often seen in sea life. One particular gesture might cause a player to rapidly grow a ring of additional fingers surrounding a gaping anemone-like mouth in the palm, while another could result in the player's entire arm flattening into a fin-like appendage. Regardless of how severe a departure from a typical human limb the final gesture would be, the limbs, and on rare occasions the entire body, of the player using the gesture will quickly and irreversibly mutate into the shape required to successfully perform it. While these gestures overwhelmingly result in forms that would be distressing to most people, the same cognitive effect that causes the participants to accept changes to the rules also appears to apply to the changes affecting their own bodies. To the players of an SCP-4633 augmented match of rock-paper-scissors, the non-standard gestures seem as mundane as the original three. Unfortunately, the morphic properties of SCP-4633 are practically irreversible, with extreme reconstructive surgery being required in even the best of cases. In all instances of SCP-4633, surgical intervention is necessary to prevent the spread of details regarding the non-standard gestures and their usage. Because of the immediate shift in cognitive awareness among participants, all that is needed for a new instance of SCP-4633 to occur is the faintest hint of knowledge of the alternative rules. It's even been noted that between different groups of players, the non-standard gestures can vary heavily or seemingly be created on the fly as the desire to win at all costs takes hold. Here are a few examples of anomalous gestures which have been observed during instances of SCP-4633. This list is by no means comprehensive, but it will provide an insight into how SCP-4633 drastically alters the existing mechanics of the game, as well as the physique of the players. The Thoriley gesture transforms the user's fingers into barbed tentacles. It beats paper and scissors, but loses to rock. Chavoaga folds the fingers of the hand into the palm and causes them to emerge through the back of the palm. It allows the user to throw a second gesture after they've seen their opponent's choice. Ashkelhaz splits the hand into a pair of poisonous stingers, which also produce a potent electrical current between them. It has been seen to lose to paper, but seemingly of their own will, the stingers lashed at the opposing player and caused them to fall unconscious three rounds later due to the effects of the poison. Shausa beats paper and two other anomalous gestures, loses to scissors, rock, and a third gesture, and morphs the user's arm into a dactyl club similar to the front appendage of a mantis shrimp. Izurgov simply causes the player to grow three additional thumbs on one hand. The final gesture resembles a triple thumbs up. Izurgov has not been seen to beat any gestures, and the player who uses it always seems to go on to lose the match. Pagakmar causes the middle and ring to recede into the hand, while the pointer and pinky fingers extend to resemble the eye stalks of a snail or slug. The rest of the hand also becomes coated in a thin layer of slime which continues to secrete from within. Pagakmar beats scissors and paper, but loses to rock and another anomalous gesture known as Vyanjek. Incidentally, Vyanjek causes the arm of the player using it to elongate into a worm-like tube that periodically spews a gout of salt water on the opponent. When Vyanjek was seen beating Pagakmar, the salt water appeared to have some adverse effect on the latter gesture, causing the eye stalks to droop and the hand to shrivel until it was half its original size. Another anomalous gesture is Grazathrog, recognized by the skin, muscle, and veins of the hand turning translucent, revealing a pulsing red organ in the interior of the palm. Once Grazathrog has been thrown, the player who used it may call out the name of one other gesture, which can no longer be used in the current match. The Ukayag gesture is a bit deceptive, as it resembles rock when first thrown but gradually causes the hand to condense into a lump of inert material, not dissimilar to actual igneous rock. 
The knuckles as well begin to exude a superheated mineral substance similar to molten lava. Ukayag exclusively beats paper and appears to lose to everything else. Many of the gestures on record have no known name, but their function within SCP-4633's altered rules is clear from the context in which they were used. Such is the case with one anomalous gesture, which caused most of the player's hand to withdraw into a siphon-like opening at their wrist before the very same orifice shot out a stream of ink into the opposing player's eyes. While there was no lasting harm done to the opponent by this gesture, the ink did cause temporary blindness, which persisted until they were defeated by way of their rock losing to paper. Another unknown gesture has been seen beating both Izurgav and Ukayag. This gesture makes the player's hand resemble the crest and gas-filled body of a Pacific Man o' War. These examples are only scraping the surface of the seemingly endless possibilities that SCP-4633 has to offer. As you can see, the anomalous hand gestures can be just as dangerous within the game itself as the permanent changes they invoke in the user. While the Foundation has done its best to contain all information surrounding SCP-4633, there have been clear efforts by several unknown groups to push the game into continued usage. Over the past three decades, instances of SCP-4633 have seen increasing popularity in the world of high-stakes gambling. Perhaps it is because of the inherent thrill of watching two opponents trying to strategically outwit each other with a countless number of non-standard gestures, but more likely, it is part of the anomalous effect of SCP-4633 that the game would appeal to those desperate to risk everything on the slim chance of victory. This neatly brings us to the SCP-4633 related incident which occurred aboard the private ocean liner known as the SS Fateful Emma. Before the incident, the Fateful Emma would sail into international waters twice a year. Each time it would bring along a new group of passengers, seemingly selected from the underprivileged and downcast sector of society. A great many of these passengers were convicts with repeat violent offenses chosen from supermax facilities the world over. The process by which these inmates were chosen for a voyage aboard the ship was not dissimilar from the methods the Foundation uses to acquire new Class D personnel. Naturally, this was how the research team was able to be tipped off about the fateful Emma. It became apparent soon after looking into the ship's career that the individuals altered by the effects of SCP-4633 had been seen departing from the ship on multiple occasions in remote island harbors. Most of the time, the individuals would also be, to the best of their ability with their metamorphized forms, carrying briefcases filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. While witnesses tend to write off the strange appearances of those affected as being the result of a deformity or injury, or in more pronounced instances dismissing the encounters as sightings of creatures from the local mythology, it was clear to anyone familiar with SCP-4633 what was truly going on. These passengers were being made to play pitched games of rock-paper-scissors featuring SCP-4633 for massive sums of wealth, and what was worse, the grand prize winners were seemingly being released back into civilization without the knowledge of law enforcement. Of course, what the Foundation was most concerned about was the potential for the large-scale leak of detailed information involving SCP-4633. It seemed that the Foundation's latest faceless enemy had revealed itself. Whatever wealthy group of individuals was pulling the strings behind the games aboard the SS Fateful Emma, it was very likely that the ship was also well protected by a private army of trained mercenaries. In a display of swift but necessary initiative, the Foundation assembled a brand new mobile task force to be dispatched onto the ocean liner. Mobile Task Force Row 52, with the fitting code name Rochambeau. The mobile task force would board the vessel secretly and use whatever means necessary to prevent the spread of SCP-4633 and any evidence of the associated non-standard hand gestures. Before the fateful Emma's next voyage, the Foundation isolated the port where it would depart from and made sure that the MTF agents were in position. The operation was co-captained by Agent Dubois and Agent Zhang, both of whom prided themselves on having extraordinarily good luck. Agent Dubois would stealthily move the majority of the agents under his command into the cargo hold below deck and await Agent Zhang's signal. Agent Zhang himself would assume the name and identity of one of the criminal passengers, who was intercepted before boarding by the mobile task force. The would-be participant was subsequently detained and brought into the Foundation as a Class D personnel. As the SS Fateful Emma began to leave the harbor, 
Agent Zhang joined the other passengers who had been gathered together in an enormous function hall. There was little indication of when the games would begin, and Zhang made an effort to keep a low profile until more information was available. Shortly after the ship had officially arrived in international waters, an eccentric man entered the room on a walkway that overlooked the rest of the passengers. He was flanked by a pair of armed bodyguards. It was plain from the man's style of dress and demeanor that he was both absurdly wealthy and completely out of his mind. He wore a pure white tuxedo and a scarf that seemed to have been made from the fur of a Siberian tiger. A pair of dark shades with sequin rims obscured his eyes from view, but by far the strangest aspect of the rich man was the fact that emerging from the wrist of his right arm was the eyeless head of a moray eel where his hand should be. The man spoke, addressing the entire room. Welcome passengers new and old to the SS Fateful Emma. While you are aboard this ship, your fate is in your own hands. Over the next 24 hours, you will have the rare opportunity to play the greatest game of chance that humanity has ever known. Generations of people from every continent and every walk of life have given their all to the mastery of rock, paper, scissors, across, no, slot, or slash, sis. The man proceeded to speak unusual syllables for the next minute straight without even a pause for breath. In his report, Agent Zhang described the man's voice as gaining an increasingly loud hum as his speech continued, and that some of the syllables didn't seem to be the product of human vocal cords. He soon concluded his string of gibberish and resumed speaking intelligible language. As is customary, we will be utilizing the Iljesh Toei rules. You will begin by selecting a single opponent and challenging them to a best of two of three match. This is a single elimination tournament, and any competitors who cannot otherwise continue to engage in matches will also be eliminated. By the end of your time here, the luckiest among you will be named the undisputed champion of these games and will be granted unlimited freedom, along with the cash prize. The rest of you will have to determine your own fates, for you all know what awaits you below. May your hands be ready, your minds be sharp, and remember, winning is everything. With a flourish of his moray eel hand, the wealthy man finished his introductions and promptly exited the room. Agent Zhang looked at the passengers surrounding him and saw that they were already beginning to play rock, paper, scissors with each other. A few had already begun using the anomalous gestures, warping their limbs into hideous subnautical shapes. Agent Zhang gave the signal to Agent Dubois and the rest of the mobile task force to begin the operation. Their target was primarily the moray-handed man, as well as any other close associates that he had on board. They would capture him alive and interrogate him into revealing the mystery behind this illegal gambling ring. Once the mercenaries were dealt with, Agent Dubois' team would further command the ocean liner and navigate it to SCP Foundation Research Site 45 to await further orders. As for Agent Zhang, he knew what he had to do. To buy time, he would participate in the ensuing Rock Paper Scissors tournament and eliminate as many of the other players as possible. This, he believed, was the best way to minimize the number of anomalous gestures that would be used aboard the ship. Of course, he himself wouldn't be using any of the anomalous gestures either, opting to limit himself to the standard three. This could put him at a severe disadvantage over the course of the competition, but Agent Zhang knew better than to tempt fate. Still, being eliminated seemed like something he may want to avoid. Even though the consequences for elimination were left vague in the strange rich man's speech, he still didn't feel that it would be wise to put himself in a compromised position while aboard the fateful Emma. Bracing himself for the worst, Agent Zhang accepted the challenge of a nearby passenger. He was off to a promising start when he threw a scissors hand against his opponent's paper. Because the matches were best two out of three, all he needed was to win one of the next two matches, and he'd survive this round. Then he saw the devious look on his opponent's face, and he knew that this match was about to get weird. Rather than admit defeat, Agent Zhang prepared to throw scissors again. The two challenged their hands, and just as Zhang had feared, his opponent threw an anomalous gesture. Almost instantly, the opponent's hand took on a multi-mouthed piscine form, which began to spit sharp teeth in Agent Zhang's direction. Fortunately, the agent's bulletproof vest was able to withstand the impact of the teeth. What was even more fortunate was the fact that the opponent seemed to be a good sport. Scissors beats, Azravok, you win. 
said the other passenger before walking away in search of their next match. Curiously, the passenger's transformed arm continued to fire teeth across the room at random intervals, occasionally hitting and causing injury to one of the other competitors. Agent Zhang was grateful that the body armor he was wearing had been tested to withstand rapid fire from SCP-127. Compared to the raw power of the living gun, the teeth launched from Azravok gestures were practically BB rounds. He had succeeded in not being eliminated, both from the game and generally. Excited about his win, Zhang sought out another opponent to test his luck. Below deck, Agent Dubois and the rest of the mobile task force had just finished facing off against some of the hired mercenaries when they entered a room presumed to be the ocean liner's sick bay. Inside was a grisly sight. A second rock-paper-scissors tournament playing out between players that had been so thoroughly transformed by the anomalous gestures of SCP-4633 that they barely appeared to still be human. It was like a scene from a deep-sea documentary, with strange and unknowable creatures vying for dominance, not within a natural food chain or competition for resources, but within a seemingly never-ending struggle to win a game of chance. It was purgatory. Rock, paper, scissors, purgatory. Agent Dubois was appalled, but he knew better than to attempt to stop these creatures from doing the one thing keeping them all distracted. The moray-handed man was still somewhere in the ship, and capturing him was far more important. The research team would decide what to do with these former humans once the ship was secure within the Foundation's custody. However, what Agent Dubois didn't realize is that some of these creatures were advancing on his team. In nightmarish and unearthly voices, they chanted, Rock, rock. Paper. Scissors. Suddenly, one of the abominations, who resembled nothing more closely than an enormous mass of coral, produced four arms from within its body and began to throw anomalous hand signs towards the agents. One of the arms threw Ukyag, which coated an unsuspecting agent in hot lava, causing him to drop to the floor in pain. Panic Dubois ordered the task force to eliminate every living thing in the sickbay although not in the sense of their tournament standing, of course. Meanwhile, Agent Zhang was on a win streak in the function hall. Through sheer luck and determination, he had managed to avoid elimination while eliminating several other passengers himself. He began to notice that those who were eliminated were quietly escorted away by the bouncers, seeming to have their anomalous changes treated. Now it was only down to 12 remaining passengers. Agent Zheng knew that it was only a matter of time before Dubois and his team took control of the ship, but feeling reckless, he challenged one of the remaining passengers. In that moment, something came over him, as if his determination to see the mission through was also compelling him to win at any cost. His opponent threw Pagakmar, and out of instinct, Zheng threw Vanyanjek. The agent went on to win the entire tournament, but sadly, he was unable to collect the prize money, as during the skirmish below deck, the man with the moray hand had escaped with a small fortune in a high-speed submersible. His ultimate goals and the scope of the shadowy group he represented would remain unanswered for the time being. When the SS fateful Emma finally arrived at Site-45, Agent Zhang came to his senses and realized that he had underestimated the cognitive side effects of SCP-4633. Due to the immediately recognizable anomalous state of both his arms, Agent Zhang was later contained on site with minimal security. It's believed that researchers are still searching for a method to reverse the effects. It just goes to show that winning isn't everything. Now go check out SCP-439 Bone Hive and SCP-3989 The Bone Orchard for more terrifying tales of body horror.